If you want to pump your body and expand your mind, there's only one place to go. Mind Pump. Mind Pump. With your hosts, Sal Stefano, Adam Schaefer, and Justin Andrews. Yeah, so Corey Schlesinger. <laughs> did I say his name right? Schlesinger? Yeah, you said it right this time. Good okay, job. I said it right. Yeah. Thanks. Good thing Doug didn't record the first one. Yeah, it's good uh, You met him first, Justin. I did. I was able to go up to Stanford, and I feel like I already said this before, but yeah, I was like hanging out, and we got to see his facility, and uh, he just kind of broke down the way that he programmed for all these athletes, and I was so impressed with you know what he's doing up there that I thought he'd be a great guest. So he's what, the coach, the strength coach for... Yes, the he's a strength team. coach for the men's basketball team. And also, I was connected to him from Jordan Shallow, so I knew that Jordan Shallow wouldn't just throw any schlub our way, right? That's right. No, <laughs> he's a great dude, dude. Very cool yeah. guy. And he's, you know what? Awesome. We we get into this episode, we get to talk about those of you guys that are like sports. You guys, if you like the, the PJF performance you'll like pod, this one. you'll it's love it. It's a great follow-up to it's, that. It is a great follow-up to that. And this was really, really enjoyable. I love the fact that we're diving into sports. I got a chance to talk to him about basketball forever, not a little bit on the show and even longer afterwards. And one of the things that I was fascinated by was they are doing what I knew the Golden State Warriors were already doing, which was tracking the movement of the players. And there's only a handful of NBA teams and college teams that are doing this, and Stanford's one of them. And in fact, they, he talks about it in the episode about being the first uh, college campus to actually implement this into. Mm-hmm. Their He's rest. a very holistic look at the whole entire process, which I really appreciate. And it really falls in line with a lot of the way that we think about training too. So yeah, I really enjoy interviewing these, uh, these coaches who are just so smart, you know, there's mm-hmm. a lot you can learn from them. Yeah. Um, you can find him on Instagram at Schles strength. I can't pronounce it, but it's pretty, but this is how you spell it. Yes. S C H L E S strength that's where you can find him on uh instagram and we also mentioned everly well because we started talking about like testing hormones and how he thinks that's the future and we think that's also the future of of athletic testing is testing hormone levels and to see if a workout is is doing you know them good if the diet is affecting the hormones in a positive way i talk about how everly well tests are so easy to take you can do them at home and how I think it's beneficial for people to monitor these things at least a few times a year to see how their body's responding to the programs. Um, and we are sponsored by them. So if you go to everlywell.com and use the code MINDPUMP, you'll get 15% uh, off any test. Also, of course, MAPS Anywhere, half off all month long. That's the equipment-free MAPS program. Just go to mapswhite.com and use the code WHITE50. That's W-H-I-T-E, the number 50, without a space, at checkout. And before we get started with the episode, I don't want to get too into this, but tomorrow we have a big announcement. Tomorrow is a big Shh. Black Friday Shh. announcement. Don't tell them. Big. You'll have to tune in uh, tomorrow Friday. in our episode to see what the hell's going on. It's kind of crazy. But that's it. It's big. That's it. So without any further ado, here is your interview. Let's go. Corey, have you done a podcast yet? Yeah, I've done a few. Okay. Yeah, yeah, uh, not like this, though. This is like... Fucking Rogan yeah. compared to what the fuck I've been doing. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, that, typically, I, I mean, we haven't been in a podcast that uh, we, we've been around podcasters for the last four years and not a lot of, not a lot of energy and focus was put on the sound quality if, mm-hmm. and shit. I get, you know, I, I know for sure the three of us knuckleheads wouldn't have if it wasn't for Doug. No. Doug is like uh, Mr. Anal Sound over here. And <laughs> I thought that was going to go somewhere else. Right. Yeah. <laughs> but I, Brought to you by Doug. Yeah. <laughs> but I do, I do appreciate it now because, it, you know, when I listen to other podcasts, it's just it, he's ruined my experience of listening to anybody else that gets, sounds like they're in a fucking bathroom. And so... You know, you're starting to see it start to level up. So I think you're going to see more and more studios like ours eventually pop up. But right now, podcasting, so it's in its infancy still. So there's a lot of people that are just kind of ripping yes, it off their the fucking Wild computer West. or mm. at their house or whatever. So you'll see it to evolve soon. <clears throat> are we good, Doug, over there? We're good. Oh, nice. Oh, right on. Yeah, we're hot, man. We're hot. Dude, so you came in here and... Like, on a scooter. Last time I saw you, you're <laughs> jumping, you're running, everything's great, and all of a sudden you're on a scooter. What happened, man? Dude, I was an athlete, man. I mean, <laughs> I was a high level. Okay, I wasn't getting paid for that, but um, yeah, I tore my Achilles, uh, trying to to be great. So we were playing, <laughs> we were playing pickup about two and a half hours right before our first exhibition. Yeah, and uh, yeah, it was the last play of the game. Naturally, you know how that goes, and. Um, 
it had to be put in my hand, so I had to go get a bucket, and I did not get a bucket. Oh, no. <laughs> and you didn't score? Didn't no. score either, man. It was a damn manager's foot I landed on. And it's the manager's man, foot. No. Damn manager. Uh, so I give him a very hard time, and he gets a lot of hard tasks um, from here on out. <laughs> yeah. Uh, now he's a great kid. But yeah, I land on his foot, and uh, I knew exactly what happened. I didn't get the rupture, which was, um, at first, I thought that was awesome, yeah. but um, and. Like hours later, like generally when you get the rupture, you lose the pain sense. Like, oh, it's, you know, because you kill those nerve endings, but the pain stayed. And I didn't get that baseball bat feeling. Mm. Uh, like someone smacked me. So I was like, okay, it's all, it's all intact. I'm good. And then, um, yeah, an hour later, our team doc comes, sees me, tested negative. I think it's called the Thompson test. Mm-hmm. And then uh, we went into surgery or had an MRI the next morning, surgery the next day. So, so they had to reattach it. Yeah, so it was really close to the insertion, and basically at that point it was string cheese. Mm. So they had to lengthen me up top, stretch me down, uh, and then I had this deformity. So they had to shave off my heel bone essentially, and then reattach. So a fun one. Wow, wow. it's gonna take a little while to rehab that. No. Yeah, fact, fact. <laughs> now I know you're the sports performance coach for Stanford basketball. Tell us how you got to that. Like, how did you? How, what led you to here? Man, that's it's a it's an interesting story. So I play college basketball. Uh, do not look up my stats; like not impressive at all. Uh, <laughs> but you know, I was more like the N one mixtape kind of guy. Like, I, oh, I love the flash. I <laughs> love right. all that. So you know, I played this, the lowest level of college basketball. But I went to a very interesting university. It's called Berea or school. It's called a Berea College. It's in Kentucky, and uh, they would pay for me to go do internships. So it was a really cool experience. Um, so, and you, of course, you get course credit. So I started my journey into strength uh, at the Wake, at Wake Forest University when I was 18 years old, first summer. And then um, from that point, I just kept jumping internships to internships. Luckily, I had a really good resume just coming out of college. So my uh, next internship was at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, oh, where I met my mentor. And uh, his name is Jonas Serration, the most brilliant individual that I've ever met. Um, still <laughs> blows me away with all of his information. But um, from that point, um, my current coach, we used to play noon ball together at Carolina. So that's how we started our initial relationship. After there, I was a, a intern at the Olympic Training Center, Colorado Springs, working with combative and acrobative athletes before the 2012 games. So the mindset, like people want to talk about mindset. Yeah. Wow. Like just even being around those folks, mm-hmm. like it, it, it like every switch, little right? tiny incremental progress matters. It, it was unreal. Like it, it was, how did you I, separate yourself from other people to be able to be the one to help them with that? Like what made you, what made them work with you and not someone else? Man, to be honest with you, it's it, like, especially in strength. Uh, it's all about who, you know, like I hate, like I hate to sound like a business, mm-hmm. but you know, my mentor is very well known and I threw that on the resume. I'm 19 or at that point I was 20, 21 years old. And when the directors at the Olympic Training Center saw that, they're like, whoa. So when they saw that you worked with this guy, they're like, oh, he, we got to get that. Yeah, we need to bring him in. Like, now, all why, free work? Yeah, we need to bring him in. <laughs> <laughs> now, why is that? What is it about your mentor? What made him so special? What is it that he taught you that oh, made well, people just pro- want to bring you on board? Best basketball organization out there, right? I mean, yeah. you know, it, it's funny you say that because the <laughs> – Man, I'm 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 about to start a lot of fires here. But <laughs> here we go. Yeah, you know, the higher up you go, the worst strength coaches I think you see. Really? Yes. hundred percent. hundred percent. And the lower you go, the worst strength coaches you see. The best are around the middle. Interesting. You know, like, now there's some brilliant people like in spots. Like and, and once again, I'm I'm probably biased, but his body of work and a lot of other people in my field that respect him could, would agree, say he's probably the best. And mm-hmm. he just so happens to work with one of the best blue blood programs in college basketball. Mm-hmm. Uh, but for him, it's the, the holistic approach. Mm-hmm. Um, and I never thought in the way that he thinks. Mm-hmm. And so he started me down this path of um, not necessarily a hammer is your only tool, right? Like powerlifting, everybody's got to get stronger. Like Everybody starts in this field trying to be a a bodybuilder, be a powerlifter, and then they're like, "Oh, let's be a little bit more athletic and become an Olympic weightlifter." Right? Mm -hmm. That's I think that's everyone's evolution in my field. Um, And then he got me way further along at such an earlier age, so I was able to dabble um, and meet a lot of brilliant people just because of his name alone. Right? Because you also told me like before that you were a purist in terms of a lot of Fact. these like, yeah, like Olympic lifts and power lifts and all that. So was that your mentality going into the internship with him? 
No, so to be honest with you, going into the internship with him, okay, once again, like we're all, remember 18, 19 years old, like yeah. you get a little taste of something, you're like, I know it all. Right. <laughs> like, I, I got, of course. I got life figured out, right? Like I got my <laughs> license, fuck, you can't tell me anything. Uh, so that's how I was. Like, so I'll never forget my first day in his weight room. Uh, I'm cleaning something or whatever. And he goes, uh, are you going to lift today? I was like, shit, yeah, I'm going to show this guy I can lift. So I was like, yeah, I'm going I'm to clean, right? Because if you can clean, then you're good. Right? Yeah. If you can hit a good clean, like, you're automatically respected. Worked up to, I think, like 80 kilos, something like that. Bang. All of a sudden, I hear in the back, what the fuck was that? And I was like, <laughs> oh, shit. And I was like, damn, I should have benched today. Like, fuck, that was bad. Wrong um, move. And so... You know, it was the the attention to detail that he had. And right. he put me down the purest path. Mm. And so okay. going down the purest path was great. But in reality, I mean, we work with athletes, right? right? So it's more of not necessarily the purest standpoint. It's just the quality control. Mm -hmm. So that's what I cared about the most. And so that's you think, what it, if you, it wasn't for him, it would have been that. You think it's important to have that purest, uh, those purest roots so that you can identify quality of movement when you're working with an athlete? Because there's so many different things that they're doing. Absolutely. I, I feel like at some point you have to compete, mm -hmm. right? If you're a good strength coach, I think you need to compete in something. Whether it's powerlifting, whether it's weightlifting, whether it's bodybuilding even. like I know that sounds crazy, bodybuilding. But mm -hmm. the things that you take away from those disciplines, like for instance, like bodybuilding for me, like I did now. Once again, a long time ago, and I sucked at it. Wait, wait, you did bodybuilding? I did bodybuilding, believe it or not. Um, yeah, I was a uh, glorified swimmer on stage. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but just going through that dieting process alone, the discipline. I mean, that's 12 weeks of like perfect, perfect everything, mm -hmm. and I still sucked, right? So like from that perspective, and then if you really want to learn about nutrition, put your body through that. Mm -hmm. right? Like if, mm -hmm. if you really want to know Absolutely. the effects of 20 carbs, put your body through that. And then you can totally understand how everything else affects each other, right? Mm. Um, uh, I'm sorry, I digress. No, We're, when you when you mentioned the holistic uh, approach, what did you mean by that? Did you mean like he's looking at an athlete and looking at a whole? Because then you mentioned the hammer. He's looking at a whole tool chest and saying, with this athlete, we're going to use some stuff from yoga or some stuff from Olympic lifting. Or uh, like, is that is that right? Accurate? I see what you're saying. Yeah. So it's more of yeah. You have to you have to be almost a what is it? What's the term? Um, a master of uh, one or whatever. jack of all. Yeah. yeah. So or jack of all trades. Mm -hmm. And yeah, uh, for him it was more of like you got to be a master of all trades. Like in some form or fashion, like you got to you got to be able to be able to a demonstrate and number one, understand the purpose. Right. So in all these sub disciplines, you know, it, it, even from return to play protocols, from tissue, from, you know, things that come in from other areas like physical therapy, um, athletic training, uh, all, all the sub disciplines of sports medicine, because. You know, I love to think of myself as a sports performance coach. Like, oh, man, yeah, these guys are performing at a higher level because of me. But in reality, especially in this day and age of college basketball or in NCAA sports in general, it's you're making sure kids aren't fucked up. Mm. Like when these kids come in, I mean, they're broken toys. So you got to start not from zero. I mean, it's like negative three. Oh, wow. Just to get them to, oh, now we can do some general strength mm. training. Now, and then you're in year three, year four, and you're like, oh, we did a couple of things that was pretty special. Now, what do you mean by broken toys for the listeners who are, who are hearing this and aren't super privy to, you know, that level of competition? For sure. When you're getting these new athletes in and you're saying they're broken, like, what are you seeing? What do you notice? Well, I mean, surgeries. Uh, like, I mean, I got... I got kids who've had two or three surgeries before the age of 18. Mm -hmm. Wow. Like, what's going on here, right? And you can blame it on, you know, early specialization and AAU basketball year-round. You can blame it on all these other things. But in reality, I think it goes way deeper than that. I think it goes into, and once again, I can digress with this, but I think it goes into you know, our Western education right now. I think it goes into that we don't have physical education at an early age or it's not as popular as it used to be. Yes. And so now you got kids who have zero motor competency, but they just so happen to have some genetic potential and some talent. And then now they play one sport all the time. So now they're in these fixed patterns mm -hmm. and you wonder why. Like when I get guys, I don't get good athletes. I don't get a single good athlete. I get a good basketball player. Mm -hmm. So there's a huge difference between being a good athlete and being a good basketball player. Mm -hmm. Just because you can demonstrate some things with a basketball in your hands, like you can jump real high off one leg, man, you see them watching just do a basic body weight squat. You go, oh, Jesus, how do you do what you do without wrecking yourself? I see. Mm -hmm. So it, that's, 
that's more the the. Now right that's downward. crazy. So. Uh, when you get these guys, do you have to really regress to programming then? Are you doing some very basic now? And how challenging is that for you and them mm-hmm. where they're like, just show me this or give me that? And you're like, no, 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 listen, you can't even fucking body weight squat yet. I'm not going to load you with 300 pounds. Like, how does that pan out? Well, you know, we do, we do some pretty interesting things. So at Stanford, I have one of the best facilities for this. Uh, so uh, Coach Borelli, he's the wrestling coach. He has this huge, huge wrestling room. Like It's like the size of a half court of just all padded floors and padded walls. Right. And so from there, day one, we go in there and it's what you would think of physical education back in the 50s and 60s. Right. It's like tumbling, like low level gymnastics. Oh, wow. Um, we take some um, aspects of jujitsu training. So partner training. Um, so it's more about like them understanding their body, body, body awareness. awareness. Yeah. That's all it is. It's all. It's all it is. Because once again, if if they don't even know how to use their own body, let's add external resistance to that and see what happens. Right. Right. You're going to blow them up even faster. So we have a, a ton of assessments, but one of my favorite is a no-handed get up. Mm-hmm. Right. Oh, I have yeah. my guy sit down on the ground, get up. Sit down on the ground, get up. Do a lot of guys fail at that at that age? Oh, absolutely. Wow. But yeah. the thing is, like, I don't give them any instruction. I think that's a huge mistake that we make as coaches is we give them too much instruction. Mm-hmm. Like, here, do this, and I want you to do boom, 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 boom. Like, you want the perfect movement day one. Mm-hmm. No, I don't want that. I want the worst movement day one because I want to see what yeah. their natural uh, tendencies are. Mm-hmm. So, for instance, I don't give them any cues. I just say, sit down on your ass, stand up. Sit down, stand up. All right, do it 50 times. And you just watch the repetitive patterns. And you start to see what's breaking down, what's not working, what's Absolutely. working. Absolutely. You start seeing, all, oh, oh, man, why do they always put their right hand down? Mm-hmm. Why are they always flexing to their left side? Why are they always standing up with that same leg? Mm-hmm. And then when they sit down, why do they just flop down? Right? Why can't they cross their legs? And then you see some guys, I was surprised. You're like, man, they got good hip internal and external rotation. And then once you start seeing uh, these things manifest, then you start taking things away. Mm. All right, now you can't use your hands. Get up and get down. <laughs> oh, shit. Right. Yeah, then you, you find the real problem, right? No T-spines, no hips, no, no nothing, right? So then you you know you give them a little little assistance, um, and then you let them use momentum, and then that's that's the quote unquote functional movement screen. Just being able to get up and get down. That's what we do as humans every single day. Uh-huh. But these kids are already screwed at that. So wow. you want to talk about recovery? You want to talk about you know all these things? So adding basketball, adding weights, adding all this, but they can't even get out of bed properly. Yeah. Come on. Mm-hmm. Like, I got to make them better humans before I can make them better athletes. And until then, you know, it's, it's about being a better human. Right. No, it's, 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 I love that you're saying this because I think if you just make somebody stronger, will their performance improve? Yes. However, it'll come with a lot of other risks because they haven't corrected how they move and they haven't become more efficient. If I correct someone's movements and make them more efficient at how they move and make things move better, then they'll perform better and it'll come with the benefit of more safety and less risk of injury. It's like adding more horsepower to a car yep. that's not secured, that everything's not secured. Like you're, you're, The chance that something's going to blow up is much, much higher. And how hard is that conversation to have right. with an athlete? Because you're Stanford. Like, you know, right. hey, I'm a badass now. I'm playing for Stanford. <laughs> right. I'm obviously smart. Right. You know, I'm sure you get a lot of kids who are like, I know more than you do or think they do. Fact. Like, how do you, <laughs> how do you talk to them about and say to them, look, no, actually, no, this whole season, we're just going to be getting up off the floor right. and, and with no hands. We're not going to be, in, you know, lifting all kinds of weight. Well, I, I do throw cherry pie, and that's what I call it. I throw a cherry pie because at the end of the day, my sport is tank top season all year round. Right? <laughs> so, oh, yeah, we'll throw in some arms. They're good. <laughs> you know, we throw in arms, all is good. Doesn't matter what we did before that or after that. You throw in some gun show, or we call it, you know, the arm farm since we're the on the arm farm. farm. <laughs> you know, uh, then we're we're all good. Like it doesn't matter what we do. And that's safe. Uh, you could just throw in some curls right. and you know you're some curls, okay. you're great. Yeah, yeah, you're like, hey, fucking nothing up like this. That's exactly. great. <laughs> so you know, I, that's the cherry pie, right? And so. Um, you know, it, they have a deep understanding and they all actually do their own research. Like the Stanford athlete is different than any other athlete I've ever came in touch with. Like mm-hmm. at first it was boring because they were just, yes, yes, sir. No, sir. Like, the, boom, boom, boom. I mean, they were just great young adults. I was sitting there like, man, I'm, I'm used to shitheads. Like I'm used to guys, <laughs> that are, but these are just great young human beings that were raised by great parents that came from good households. Yeah. But, you know, there's the other side of that, too. 
You know, there's a side where, you know, maybe they don't, they're not as tough, right? Or maybe they don't have as much, um, they didn't have as much adversity growing right. up, you know? So there's the other side of that too. So what do I do? So in my world as, uh, or my role as a strength coach or a sports performance specialist or whatever title we want to give ourselves these days, it's where you got to find your value. So, you know, what I was at other schools, I'm totally different at the school I'm at now, right? So, you know, I'm an, I, I'm an identifier for a lot of things, for personality traits, for, I'm not saying disorders, but mood issues, right? You know, things where, like we were talking about earlier, we're in a wrestling room day one and we're having them do certain these things and then we're pushing and pulling each other and we're carrying each other and we're, and you just see attitudes and you can see a couple of them like, you know, what the fuck are we doing? Okay, that guy's not going to enjoy when shit gets hard, mm-hmm. right? Or, for instance, um... I mean, when you turn up the temperature in the room, now we'll start adding a little bit of volume to what we're doing because, you know, we learn the pattern. So it's add some volume. You see guys break down. It's not because of physical capacity. It's because of mental capacity. And then you're like, okay, hey, coach, these are the things that I'm forwarding to him saying, hey, these are what I'm seeing in a controlled environment. Now imagine a basketball environment, which is dynamic. You know, there's another team. Mm -hmm. There's the crowd. There's all this Mm -hmm. pressure. There's all the fast actions, you know. So I think it's going to get magnified. So here's information to you, coach. You know, so that you understand what you got now. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Interesting. What are some of the most common traits that you're seeing in these students that you need to work on, or, or I guess imbalances? What What are those, some of the most common ones? Uh, time management is number one. Oh, okay. Like these kids on like it's it's. I mean, okay. I'm still learning how to be an adult, so I can't I can't talk too much crap. But for them to understand, like, oh, if I need to get X, Y, and Z done well, then I actually need to plan for that to get done. And then for me to repeat that. And that's where like time management skills, if I could teach them that from Jump Street, then we're going to, we're going to, like, their recovery, their nutrition, all that's going to take care of itself because they're handling themselves as men, mm-hmm. right? It's, I mean, sometimes like, I know for myself, I, I was graduated from my undergrad and I still couldn't do that, mm-hmm. right? I mean, I still have trouble to this day. So, you know, for those kids, if I can give them time management skills, then to me, that that's more than I can give them in sets and reps. What about mm. physically? What are some of the the uh, oh. most common imbalances and yeah, physically? Issues? I mean, they're they're trash. Like so, my good friend at Texas, his name's Daniel Roos. He gave me the best analogy ever uh, for what we get, and he's like, we have giraffes with clown shoes. <laughs> That is brilliant. Wow, that paints like, a great picture. That's that's exactly what I got coming in the door. <laughs> you know, I got guys just with really tall and goofy. Dude, yeah, it's, it's unreal, just, yeah. man. Like I got I got a kid. I'm not even kidding you. He's six six with a seven foot two wingspan. Oh my oh, god! Wow. What, what yeah, do you do? Doesn't he, make sense. Now, he can th- slap you from across the street. Yeah, <laughs> fact, fact. Yeah. But I mean, that's what basketball is. Long, long dudes, right? Yeah. I mean, even at the point guard positions, you got guys that have longer wingspans by a foot and a half or a foot to a foot and a half. And you're just sitting there like, I don't even know how you operate. Yeah. Right. And so right. then we want to talk about bigger, faster, stronger. Right. All right. All you gentlemen in the room, imagine, okay, now I'm going to do a simple bicep curl. Okay. Add another forearm to that. Right. Do yeah. that same curl. Yeah. Okay. Now add that to your legs, do a squat, do a run, do a jump. Shit just got real for everyone in this room because now you understand, wow, I wonder why basketball players aren't quote unquote strong. Mm -hmm. That's why, right? Right. Biomechanically, they are fucked. Long levers. Yeah, that's why you don't see six, eight dudes in the Olympics, you know, (laughs) snatching and jerking, right? Right, It makes sense, right? Mm -hmm. Well, I want you to talk a little bit about like your approach to that in terms of like how to regress a lot of the exercise, risk versus reward, and like how you came to conclude kind of what was most beneficial for your athletes. Great question. Um, is, Is an evolution, to be honest with you, like, once again, when I was young, I was a purist. I was like, hey, everybody's going to snatch, clean, jerk. We're going to squat, deadlift, bench. Like, we're going we're to hit all the big threes in each category, right? And it depends on the level you're at. So when I was at Santa Clara, it was a low major. You know what? Like, all my guys did that pretty proficient. And and I'm, I'm very much anal about technique, right? So for me to, like, for me to say it, it's those guys look good, right? Then at UAB... I had guys, yeah, we clean, we snatch, jerks were okay, you know, squatting, we'd have to make some alterations, mm-hmm. deadlifts, you know, had to make. Then I get to Stanford, and I'm like, oh, so it seemed like the higher I go, the better athletes I get. Well, you know what? Those Olympic lifts, those power lifts, those, those aren't good for them. Mm. Like it, it doesn't work the same. So it's like, oh man, 
my thought process this whole time was we need to do all these lifts to be explosive and to be strong and to be all this. And it's like, well, no, because their athleticism comes from a different animal. You know, mine comes from, from my point of view, because I'm short mechanical levers. Yeah. It made me better quickly. Right. But for them, the technicality of it was so strong. I mean, any purist in the room that, that can understand like the snatch and clean, if you're pulling and you don't hit high hip, it's a problem, right? Mm-hmm. But imagine now you have that seven foot two wingspan. There is no such thing as a high hip anymore. Mm-hmm. It's all mid thigh, mm-hmm. right? Contact because of your arm length. So it's not as effective of a lift necessarily, right? So that's mm-hmm. when it's like, oh. You're bringing up great points because, yeah. you know, uh, and the great thing about especially free weights is that you can modify the hell out of them for different individuals. But when you're looking at that level of athlete, they aren't they just aren't built like the average person. If you've ever seen, I remember the first time I ever saw somebody who was over six foot eight, which is very rare in real life. You look at them, it's just, they look like a different species. It's a different human being. So what kind of exercises then do you replace some of these, what we consider foundational lifts? Like, what do you do instead of those? Great question. I, and I think this has been like my new wave. Like, it's all because of Stanford. It's all because of the kids that I got. And that's what, like, real quick, you are who your environment is. Like who you are as a strength coach is the athletes that you are training, Mm -hmm. right? And so for me, coming from that Santa Clara, that UAB, now coming into Stanford, you know, the Olympic lifts, they're great. We still use them, right? Because there's too many other things that I want to benefit from it from a neck up standpoint, not necessarily from a neck down standpoint. We can go into that later. But what I've replaced with it is really simple. It's a trap bar. Mm. Trap bar has been my savior, okay? And the reason why I say that is we do trap bar cleans, Holy shit, you think trap bar clean, you just decapitated your athlete. Like yeah. what happened, right? Yeah. 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 How's How do you that clean work? That? Yeah. Exactly. So if the listeners can imagine with me for a second, if you watch the action of a clean, right? Say we're pulling from the floor, we pull, we triple extend, and then we hit a power catch, right? So right. that means knees bend at uh, 90 degrees, you know, or above, or hips are above knees, right? And now, okay, do the exact same thing that you would see from a purist from a clean uh, with a straight barbell. Do the exact same thing with a, with a trap bar. You can still pull, you can still get into triple extension, and you can still hit that power position and hold. It's all about intent, right? Now, I didn't have to teach the athlete any bar pathways. Uh, it's in their center of mass. And guess what? We have load. Mm-hmm. So I don't have to teach it as much. They're in better biomechanical positions, and I get to load it faster. So you're not you're not bringing the trap bar up to you can't do that with exactly. the trap bar. You're you just, just doing the part. Yeah, yeah. You're you just, just doing the explosive part. Yeah, it's just like a like a shrug you would see, mm-hmm. like a clean pull or that. that which shrug. which technically technically, if mm-hmm. you think about the clean, that's most of the benefit for the, sure, especially the, for a basketball player. Well, I mean, bringing the bar up to your shoulders for the listeners who don't know what I'm talking about. When they do a clean, it means they they're bringing the you know it's off the floor, it's explosive. Then you flip the bar up and it's up on your shoulders. That last part is the probably one of the most technical parts that people mess up on or have difficulty with, but a lot of the benefit comes from before you do that part. Yeah. So I you're almost eliminating some of that and then doing... For sure. Mm-hmm. And, and then I, I can argue both sides because, yes, the pull is important. Yes, we want the concentric. Everybody's like, hey, you want to jump higher, right? So like pull, pull, pull. But we got to absorb those forces too. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So the catch, like I like the catch a lot. Oh, I see. But now just do it with the trap bar. Yeah. So instead of bringing the bar up, you just keep it by your side. You explode up, triple extension, and then boom. Instead of letting that bar drop all the way to the ground, catch you catch it. it, and then you're at a quarter squat position, and you don't let that bar move from oh, that point. Oh, I see. Yeah. So oh, I see. from that perspective, like, and once again, I would love to demonstrate uh, <laughs> for you, gentlemen. Um, but, we had um, planned on that. We'll do that later. Yeah, we'll do that later. Yeah, yeah. I'm a pirate right now. But, <laughs> Um, so yeah, I mean, so now I just took the intent of the lift that I, all the benefits that I want and I just shifted it to a different implement. Now I've never seen anybody do a clean with the trap bar. That doesn't mean it wasn't done before. I've just never seen one. Had you seen one before somewhere I've else? I've never seen one before. The only thing that I've saw was people jump with trap bars mm-hmm. and I was like, yeah, it's a loaded jump. You can do the same thing with the barbell. Makes sense. Uh-huh. But I've never seen anybody actually go with the intent of, oh, okay, here's a clean pull. Right. Oh, okay. oh, here's a clean. So, okay. Well, that's what I care about. So you invented it. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We'll call it the slush clean. The uh, slush but yeah, clean. yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, sure. Yeah. <laughs> it's fascinating. <laughs> the way you're explaining, it's absolutely brilliant. And you're absolutely right. Every time I've ever worked with a client with really, really long levers, 
just a trap bar deadlift is oh, is God, better yeah. than a than a straight bar deadlift. Absolutely, it's a yeah. savior. Yeah, it's absolutely. an absolute savior. What about some of the other exercises? Are there any replacements for like a barbell squat, or do you keep them that way, or do you more split stance exercises? Like, what's the really good question? Um, it, it depends on the cat. You know, okay. I got a seven footer who's got a long torso. You never see that. So a front squat for him is like, hey, mm. you know, mm-hmm. or, but most of the guys I have are spiders. You know, they got really small torsos, really long levers. Mm-hmm. So, you know, some of those front squat positions are actually pretty okay with them as long as they have the prerequisites, the rack bar or, you know, they have the T spine and all that. But, um, yeah, we play a lot uh, around with a lot of specialty bars. Mm-hmm. Um, I have that athletic training platform from Westside. It's basically a belt squat. Um, it's like a belt squat 2.0 though. Like you get to move in all directions that oh, you want. I see. It's I like, you know, like a pit machine. shark, yeah. you know, it's like yeah, 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 so yeah. It's straight up and down uh-huh. the uh, athletic training platform. It's basically a cord so I can move around in a lot of different planes. So you mm-hmm. can do a lot of cool stuff with it, but more importantly, you can just squat with it. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. um, now I'm not axial loading them. So I'm just loading their hips so we can get really, really strong from mm-hmm. the waist down. Um, and then I can challenge them upstairs with other things. Mm-hmm. Oh, awesome. awesome. One thing I wanted to bring up too, and I know we're kind of brushing a lot of like the, the general stuff that you do with your athletes, but like you take it to like the most comprehensive level I've seen in terms of managing forces, shearing forces, stress, like outside stuff like that. Like, can you sort of break down your programming? And I remember there was like three, uh, three main things that you were concerned, you know, in terms of like how you're managing like the strength, you know, the explosive output and the forces and all that. Can you explain that? Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, we have, so we have force plates, um, and we get a lot of good information from that, but there, there's a, there's also an, an asterisk beside that because jumping is a skill, right? Mm-hmm. And if I give a cue to jump a different way, then I got a different impulse or I got a different eccentric rate of force of element or I got, so, you know, we everything that we do in an assessment is with a grain of salt, right? Um, but as far as looking at all those forces uh, holistically, you have to have the tools in place to truly do it. Now, you can do it from an economical level, right? You can do it where you're just, for instance, oh, you're tired today? Okay, I got you. Or you could do HRV, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Or you can go, okay, well, let's look at uh, how much load you put on the bar today. And then you can go, oh, well, now we can put a Tendo on it and see how fast it went, okay? And then another level where where's the biggest stress coming from from a college basketball player? Well, it's not coming from the weight room. Mm -hmm. It's not coming from life. It's coming from practice. So how's everybody monitoring those loads? Well, luckily we have GPS. So we have this uh, company called Connexon. And so I get to see speed and distance. So now we're taking... So you're monitoring the practice. Yeah, monitoring pause practice. right there because it was yeah. something I heard. And, you know, I watch a lot of basketball and I, I heard them talking about this with the Warriors. How long have we been doing this? I, I don't remember this when I was a kid that we were monitoring this type of stuff. When, when, when did we start doing that where we are really paying attention to the miles or total like steps and movement that an athlete is taking throughout the week? The English Premier League soccer was doing it before anybody else, to my knowledge. Mm. And then possibly like international rugby. But those guys were doing it way before anybody else, mm-hmm. right? Uh, as far as hoops are concerned, uh, they had all the they had like the, the uh, I think I want to say like even five to six years ago. Yeah, it was wasn't, that, they, wasn't, it wasn't that wasn't long that long ago, ago yeah. where they had um, you know all these cameras in every arena and it's doing all this stuff and you're getting all the, these great metrics and that's cool. Um, then catapult came on the scene and they tried to make catapult into uh, the basketball arena, but the problem with that was it wasn't true GPS. Uh, it was basically accelerometer accelerometer so it's like a Wii controller on your back and it's mm. like okay I can see some limitations with that as well and then Connexon came in and their GPS indoors and now we're the flagship program that's using it uh, because we were the first adopter in college basketball okay. or actually in college sports um, but now you're seeing I think eight NBA teams now using it Golden State Warriors being one of them mm-hmm. and so you know I like to think that hey we kind of got we, we kind of got out early on mm-hmm. one of these that's too I knew it was early I was yeah. like I had never heard that so I was like that's even, so smart I don't even know what this is so they wear a device that literally tracks them and their yep. movement and their speed of movement yeah so it's basically a little chip that goes in their back right so we wear like a compression top and it has a little pouch and so I just slide their their unit into the pouch it's seriously it's like the size of a cracker it's oh, not wow. that big at all um, and then we have all these antennas set up in our practice gym in our arena and so it's communicating with it via Bluetooth, okay? And um, and I get it all in real time. So, so it's dope. web-based. It's really cool. So I can be in my weight room, 
and I can watch what kind of offense we're running on the court. Oh, that's so dumb. Time. Oh, wow. That's, that's pretty cool. Dots now, sure. what the hell I would do with that information, I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> Call it in. Hey, coach, I don't like that offense. <laughs> yeah. I don't like that. Audible. Like that. Yeah. Right, right. But Yeah, how do you use that information as a strength coach? Great question. So I am a very – I'm in a rare situation, especially in college basketball, where me and my sport coach, we get along so well. And, I mean, we've been together – this is going in year six, but he – he values my opinion, especially when it comes to stress and loads. Mm-hmm. So now no offense to my coaches, no offense to basketball coaches, no offense to you know, anybody who's trying to do the right thing via practice or games. But those guys, they know a lot about basketball. They don't know a damn thing about the human body, though. Mm-hmm. So when you think about how preseason practices were going, right, mm-hmm. they think about, OK, what do I need to get done? Mm-hmm. Right. right. What do I need? OK, so. Well, what were the effects of that? Right. Just like us as string coaches, right? We know the effects of what we did if we put a guy through a 10 by 10, mm-hmm. you know, heavy load. Right. Yeah, they're going to be fucked for a few days, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Well, coaches don't know that. Yeah, you're tending to the machine. They're tending to the strategy and the skill and all that Fact. stuff. Mm-hmm. So now, okay, well, let's add that to it. Now we have some data. Now we have some meaningful data. We have speed and distance, volume and intensity, just like we have in a weight room. Now I can talk apples to apples with my coach and say, hey, coach, total distance for this guy was this today. Um, and their XL3, which is just basically an intensity measure um, based off an NBA algorithm, is this. So that's my volume and intensity. That's sick. So now I look at it like, so sick, hey, right? today practice was short, but intensity was really high. So what would that look like in a weight room situation? Right. Yeah. Right? right. Very similar to like doing cleans, doing snatches, right? Very, very fast. Relax. And very so, fast, and relax. so, with this information, I, I can only assume that obviously he being the coach and managing the the way they play and the plays that they put together, that they're not going to necessarily change their practice. But what what I would imagine is then you would change your strength training courses according to the practice. In other words, are you watching the intensity and how much they're working out and saying, okay, or do they today's mod- workout or do they it, modify their practice? Or do they modify I would it. think they would modify their practice. Yeah. Well, some so days walk through the, days. The, right? the, com- the common sense thing is you would think, right? Yeah. yeah. In college basketball or in college sports, don't even call it back. College sports, mm-hmm. strength coaches are reactive, mm-hmm. right? So you so, have to yeah. you have to modify your training according to typically. Typically, yeah. Mm-hmm. So they're reactive. Well, if we have an understanding of what practice loads are and what our practices do to the athletes, well, now maybe we can complement it, right? Mm-hmm. So this is what most typical training sessions look like throughout a week for sports. <clears throat> Oh, today was a high day in practice, so it's a low day in weights. Mm -hmm. Oh, hey, Corey, we're not going to go that hard today, so you can crush them in the weight room. Got it. Okay. Well, holistically, what does that look like? Every day is high, 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 high. That's right, Mm -hmm. because if one's not high, the other one is. Exactly. Mm. But at the end of the day, our body doesn't know if we're playing basketball, lifting weights, having sex. Just no stress. Right? Right. Right. It's stress. Total stress. Sometimes good stress, sometimes (laughs) sometimes bad stress, right? (laughs) So our body doesn't know, Mm -hmm. right? But now... If we can complement that, so, hey, coach, you're going to gut them today? Yeah, me too, right? Mm-hmm. So now what we do is uh, we do this system called microdosing. So we actually train every single day of the year so that we're in competition or playing. So in-season training, you, you typically hear, oh, yeah, we'll, 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 we're maintaining our strength values, right? Mm-hmm. They'll train one to two times a week, more than likely none, but, you know, they're, they're maintaining their strength. Mm-hmm. Well, we actually train six times a week. Mm-hmm. So we practice five days. You're just constantly modifying it. Yeah. I mean, and so some 100%. days are real easy and short, other mm-hmm. days a little harder. And Well, so our sessions are all geared to only last 20 to 30 minutes. If it's any longer than that, I messed up. So it's almost like a strength primer for practice. Oh. Right? So if we're really getting into the nitty gritty, like, all right, coach, what do you want to do today? I want high execution. We're going to be in the half court. So what is that going to look like from a stress standpoint? Okay, well, if we're in the half court, So, and we're doing breakdowns. So that's, you know, two on two, three on three. They're going to be creating more forces because they have space and they're in shorter, they're in a shorter uh, surface area. Mm -hmm. So now they're going to be able to really like jump, push, like change. Like they're going to be high joint shearing forces, right? Mm -hmm. Well, what would I do in the weight room that day to prime them for that? Probably do like trap bar cleans, Mm -hmm. probably do snatches, probably do things that are very like priming for that. And then now I'm complementing practice, mm-hmm. not conflicting practice. That's dope. Right? Really? Very interesting. Yep. Now I'm not saying it's perfect, but we 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 do our best in our planning. Uh, yeah. You know, it's it follows right along with what we found training people for two decades, and we work with average people, everyday people. So we're not 
I, I can count maybe on two fingers the uh, the amount of high high level athletes that I worked with. It was always average people I worked with, but what I always found was that frequency was very important. You know, I would much rather have somebody come and see me five or six days a week and me modify the intensity and the load and the duration than have someone come see me once or twice or three days a week and just beat the crap out of them. The body just responds much better to that frequency of stimulation. You guys are finding the same thing. Uh, absolutely. Because, look, it's our readiness testing. If I get them right before practice and I have six dudes that are just like, whoa, mm-hmm. they come in, I even make an eye contact. We ain't even joking anymore. Like, we come, I mean, it's a, I'm not saying it's a party, but it's a party. Like, we have fun in mm-hmm. our weight room, right? Like, it should be, like, to me, like, I'm trying to create this nostalgia or this environment to where, like, as soon as we're done with weights, boom, we're right into practice, energy doesn't drop. Mm-hmm. But if energy sucks in that room, in the controlled environment, where I'm playing their favorite music, where, you know, they're, they're buddy buddy, no coaches are around, you know, they can say whatever they want, they can do whatever. If that's shitty, man, practice is going to be a tough mm-hmm. day. All right, yeah. so hey, coach, maybe maybe you need to modify, and of course, I'm modifying in the weight room as well mm. in real time. So it's almost like it's like quarterbacking it. You know, you're audibling all the time. Yeah. Um, but you know, at the end of the day, though, like you got to get strong too, mm-hmm. right? So there's the days where you know when to push the limits. Like hey, you know, we're only focusing on this one movement. That's with our microdosing session. So our A series are basically preparing you for human movement. Then we go into our B series, which B is complex complex is life like is everybody familiar well, okay the listeners are not familiar with complex uh a gentleman named Istvan Yavork um I forgot what years but anyways it's basically a circuit with the barbell or with a dumbbell or with a kettlebell okay so it's a uh, patterns like for instance here's an example of it you would do five RDLs five muscle cleans five front squats five overhead press five rows put the bar down mm. right so if you think about it that's almost every movement that you would ever do with anybody in a weight training session anyways. Mm-hmm. So now that's readiness testing. If I see how that bar is moving mm-hmm. in their warm up sets with complex, I know what's going on. So for instance, they go over to that bent over row at the end of the set and they're super high. They're like, ooh, backs are probably pretty tight, mm-hmm. right? Or they're constantly messing around with their grip with low loads, then nervous system is probably shot, right? So. These are the observations you're making in real time mm. so that you're making alterations, right? And then if they look like shit and complex, more than likely, they're not going to look good with heavier loads, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. So anything that we do in our complex will reflect what we do for our now going into our C-series, the lift of the day. Mm. So, for instance, if we're on a game day, we're doing something very elastic, very reactive. You know, you can think of jerks, snatches, barbell squat jumps, trap bar jumps, things like that. Like, very, very fast, right? The further away we are from competition, we're probably having our heavier practices. So, we're also going to have our heavier lifts, right? Mm -hmm. So, we're going to squat, deadlift, things that are going to be more damaging to the body. Because, once again, we're complementing stresses. So, that now we can wave throughout the week. So, high days, then we're going down to low days. And that's our model that we're trying to achieve is a high-low model. Mm -hmm. So, high stresses, recover from it, super compensation, right? Mm -hmm. That's the idea behind it. One thing you told me, too, uh, that you stress is, is strength training during season. Oh, yeah. Which yeah. is not, I mean, most coaches avoid strength training for the most part during the season. Like, can you speak about that? Yeah, like, the, this is the, it's the old thought, like, oh, if you lift weights, you're going to mess up your shot. That's mm-hmm. <laughs> like, if you shoot that much, which you should be shooting every single day, yeah, I don't think anything is going to affect it. <laughs> no, no matter what you do, like, you can get hammered and still shoot a ball. Right. right? Like, I mean, those are going to be there. Like, you're not going to disrupt the system that much. So, yeah, for us... That's and that's the whole purpose of the microdosing. I'm really glad you asked that question, because in the beginning, it's it's all about practice. So now we're trying to make sure that they can practice. Then you know, so we all, it's all about work capacity. So now we're able to practice great. So once again, we're looking at stress holistically. Once they've adapted to practice, now we introduce a brand new stimulus, which is games. So now we have those emotional stresses. Now we're traveling. Now the schedule is kind of up and down, right? Because we play two to three times a week sometimes sometimes we only play one time a week right so now we're constantly adapting to these new stresses that keep adding to their bucket for the college basketball season but once we get in conference play it's all the same we've already scouted these guys for half a year we play thursday saturday we travel every other week cool and then at that point of the year our practices are going down tremendously because obviously you don't want to fatigue the guy i mean it's a seven month season six Mm -hmm. month seven month season so now you know what's the point like 
practicing harder is not going to make you better. Doing film, doing skill work, all that. So now we have this huge reservoir left over of stress capacity, if you will. So now we can, well, shit, let's go get strong. Mm-hmm. Right now it's January, February, March. We're setting PRs. Oh, wow. So we're jumping our highest jumps. Trip. We're lifting our heaviest weights. And it's like, oh, shit. Yeah, maybe that's the time of the year that you want to be the strongest because you're fighting for championships, right? This is what you traditionally see. Everybody gets cock strong in the summer. Then they come in the preseason, and it's like, okay, now we're in main- maintenance mode. I've never seen a human being maintain six months. I've mm-hmm. never seen a human being maintain two hours, right? Mm-hmm. Like, it's our, our body, our, our organism is it's too... Oh, atrophy sets in real quick. For sure. But it's just such a complicated, like there's dynamic. There's the fascial lines. There's the central nervous system. There's, there's all these other dynamics that are involved that like in, in the, in the stress of the game itself, like that's everybody asks plyometrics, like Corey, like where do you put plyometrics into your program? They play a lot of fucking basketball. <laughs> <laughs> if you break down the sport of basketball, yeah. those are plyometrics. Mm-hmm. Why would I do more plyometrics? I'm going to do the things that help facilitate plyometrics. Maybe we'll work on mechanics. Maybe we'll work on, you know, basic general strength, explosive strength, you know. But I'm not going to go to more plyometrics that they're already doing. And now in the day and age of college basketball where, you know, coaches have them year-round now. Back in the day, coaches couldn't touch them in the offseason. It was all Corey time. But now coaches get with them. So now they're having two-hour practices, which, you know, they're getting a lot of work in mm-hmm. in that time. So that's another stress. And they're playing open gym. Then they're going to these camps. Then they're working out with their individual sport, or like mm-hmm. a skill coach. Basketball's year-round now. So what do we do, right? So we got to do all the things to keep them healthy. Right? How, do you, how do you monitor, when you're monitoring the, the athletes and figuring out, you know, monitoring them with the GPS and seeing how much they've moved and how fast they've moved and how intense their workouts are, how do you then apply that to the individual athlete? Because there's always that variance, right? There's always going to be some of your athletes just have a much higher work capacity than others, uh, either genetically or because they eat better or because they get better sleep or whatever. Mm-hmm. How do you then monitor that as well? Do you just ask feedback like we would you know, classically where you just ask the athlete? Or are there other metrics or things you look at? Well, my goal is to have safety nets for our safety nets, right? So, you know, there's the eye contact, right? Okay, he's feeling good today. Cool, mm-hmm. right? All right. So you're always watching. It's always observing. But then there's, okay, now we got force plate testing. Cool. Add that on top. Now we're doing our quote unquote microdosing. So now we're training every day, right? The goal with that training too, by the way, is to train heavier, faster, more often. Because think about it. If you guys walk into a gym and someone told you all you can do is one lift today, you're probably going to go balls out on that lift because you're like, fuck, man, I only get one. Mm -hmm. But then the next day you're not going to feel like trash because you only did one thing. Mm -hmm. You know, now once again, using common sense with volume and intensity. You shouldn't tr- crush yourself that much. So you know, now we get to train heavier, faster, more often, right. right? So now now we have load, and then if we're getting cute, now we have speeds of, the, of that load. So once again, more safety nets for our safety nets. And then, of course, now you add the GPS data to it. And when you're doing similar drills every day in practice and you're seeing speeds go down, you know. you're like, ooh, yeah. mm-hmm, right? What Check. do you do at that point? At that point, it's just a conversation with the coach. Like, okay. hey, coach, man. I mean, you see it. You know, I see it. Mm-hmm. You know, balls aren't, or the passes aren't as crisp. You know, balls not going in the rim as much. Guys aren't running up and down. You're going. To, you're coaching effort more. Hmm. There's a reason for that. And you right. just scale back at that. So point. then it's like fatigue masks fitness. That's one of the, my favorite terms. I think I got it from uh, my man Serration. Mm. Uh, but fatigue masks fitness. A lot of people don't understand how fit you are because they're constantly fatigued. Mm. So now, mm. once again, having these safety nets for our safety nets. Then we can understand, okay, where is it coming from? You know, if we're doing apples to apples, we're comparing certain guys in certain positions, maybe it's just their lifestyle sucks. So now it's that conversation, hey man, like, are you actually eating? Like, are you getting in the substrates that you need to be able to perform? Hey yep. man, like what's what's this week look like? Oh shit, it's midterm week. Oh, and we're at Stanford. Oh, that's some real shit. Yeah. You know, like that that ain't like, you know, a Buco Community College. Like it's real deal. Like these kids, that stress. I mean, we have to cut back everything because we know they're staying up all night studying. Mm. They're doing, they're putting all of their resources into their mental capacity to do whatever they need to do to pass, right? To do it, to do good work, right? Because that's what they're there. Student athlete, they're there to be a good student. You know, I mean, don't get me wrong. I like them to be a good athlete too, but mm. you know, they're, they're, the goal is to get a degree. I was just gonna say uh, because when dealing with college athletes, and maybe it's different at this level, but college students, some of the biggest pitfalls I can imagine are your diet. 
sleep and partying. Right. Like, how do you <laughs> do you coach to that as well? Yeah, I mean, so like, <laughs> it depends on where you're at. Mm. You know, Stanford's not really a party school. You know, like, I mean, so you don't yeah, got to worry so much about that. Not so much them. about that. You know, not so mm-hmm. much about that. And plus, you can see it the next day. Like, I got to the point <laughs> it's uh, in early in my career. Where I could just smell it, yeah. <laughs> like I could just smell. I'm like, ooh, we're sweat. vodka. Yeah. Yeah. Ooh, you're a beer guy. Like you could just, mm, damn, yeah. Yeah. that has some zest. Like I, yeah. yeah, yeah, you did some shit last night. Like I got you, okay. Um, and then, you know, it's it's almost, and, and it's what's so cool about being a, a strength coach is you will always have more access to the athlete on a personal level than any of the sport coaches, because one, you spend more time with them. Mm-hmm. Hopefully you're a decent human being, so you can you know open up those doors. But two, you don't, you don't, um, you don't uh, dictate playing time. Mm. So it's like, oh man, if I upset Corey or if I tell Corey the real truth, it ain't like he's going to like dock my minutes. Or oh, I'm going to get see. judged. Less no. less risk of them getting off the right. Yeah. So it's like, man, they can confine in me a lot. Yeah. Like they come to me with like. I get I get real problems, you know, and of course, like you gotta understand the right time, and you know, sometimes you need to bring that information up front, like to you know up the chain. It's like, oh, hey, this is some real shit. Like we gotta get this thing care of. But most of the time, you can handle it in house, and that's where you develop that trust. Like when you have that kind of conversation, or you're uh, mentoring, or you're advising, and you're trying to help a kid, man, you get some real information, and from that. It beats any GPS. It beats any metric that on, on the planet because mm-hmm. now you understand the dynamics that are going on outside of your world. I'm with them for what? Two and a half, three hours a day at most? What's happening all those other hours? Mm-hmm. Right? I don't know, right? I don't know. Like, so if I can understand their world outside of me more, then I could easily, not manipulate, because I don't like to use that word, because that's not what I'm doing to them. I'm trying to enhance their experience. Of course, you're trying mm-hmm. to steer them in the right direction. Do you sure. have a Do you have a favorite type of athlete and a, a least favorite type <laughs> of athlete that you coach? Yeah, yeah. Tell for, me. For sure. Um, okay, I used to love my weight room warrior. So the guy that like is awesome in the weight room but sucks at basketball like that, <laughs> those were my guys because I'm like, dude, that fuck it, me. we're just going to get yeah. yoked and you're going to look <laughs> awesome during warmups. Like, yeah. I mean, we're going to be all team, all warmups. You know what I'm saying? Like, we're going to the look enforcer, great. right? Gets yeah, off exactly. the bench, just fucks people up. Just say, hey man, dude, take your shooting top off. I know you're not going in, but take it off. Man. You look great. <laughs> yeah, like uh, I used to love those guys, but now, you know, because of my evolution and truly understanding what success and what, you know what weights actually or resistance training or whatever sports performance training can actually do, the more I realize, man, you know what? Weights aren't as important as I thought it was. Like, I used to think, oh, big That's a very stronger. humbling thing for a sports Dude, performance right. guy oh, yeah. I have to say. You know? A purist of <laughs> yeah. that. Yeah. I'm telling you, like, I thought bigger, faster, stronger was everything. Yeah. And then I, the more I realized, I'm like, I could probably have a room that doesn't have a single implement in it and do just as good of a job. Oh, wow. Mm. Just as good of a job. Now, don't get me wrong. Maybe they won't look like, you know, have great biceps and, and shit, but they're going to perform really, really well because I'm not, I'm not, um, I'm not conflicting like their current natural state mm. so abruptly with resistance training. Like it'll be a longer evolution. Like now their calisthenics are going to be 100, right? Their body awareness is going to be amazing. We're going to learn how to truly sprint, load, jump. If I do all of those things, great. Now they're a better athlete, okay? If they came in, like, cock diesel, then what do you do with that, right? No. But if they come in really, really skinny, well, they're probably still pretty good at basketball. You know what I mean? At the end, they didn't even be good at basketball. If you see some of these NBA players, Dwight Howard's, they're gone. Yeah. Those guys don't exist anymore. Right. It's long, lean dudes. I'm telling you, if you, if you go, please, if you get a chance to go to a Warriors game, okay, just look at the legs. Yeah. yeah. I'm telling you, they're storks. Yeah. Right. Most of these guys are storks, yeah, and you're all wondering how they like don't Kevin break Durant. their legs. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, right. And you're wondering why their legs don't break. Well, they're, they're okay. Yeah. Right. For the forces that they demonstrate, and for the skill set that they have, and all this, these, all these other factors that go into it, they're going to be all right. But if I can just enhance their natural capacity or their capabilities without adding external resistance. Yeah, you know, I, I that gets them to a level where they're confident in themselves, confident within their own frame and their own ability. Now, yes, adding external resistance will get me there faster. Yeah. But does that necessarily get me there better? I don't know yet. 
Like that's still up for debate, in my opinion. I've actually brought this up before on the show, where you know, if you took an athlete and you could snap your fingers and put, you know, even just five pounds of muscle on them instantly, what you would notice right away is they're not moving as well because they're not used to that new body, and so that slow progression maintains that because you're you're working with high level athletes. You're not working with now you train some kid who's new and never worked out, never doesn't really ever play basketball. You can you can push the strength and all that stuff and their right. skill will develop along with it but you get someone who's really really good and then you just put a lot of muscle on them real quick they're moving in a completely new body and that slight difference in their movement is the difference between super high level and maybe not as good or not as good as they were before so i completely understand what you're, what you're saying now that being said of course if you could do both and get them stronger and get them used for to the sure. body but that takes time for sure and then really it's about like yes you know, uh, muscles are great, right? But fascial lines are cooler, in my opinion. Explain. Right? So if I had a fascially driven athlete, that's like Bambi going across the field. Bing, bing. Or a deer. Not mm. Bambi. Bambi sucked. But <laughs> <laughs> but like a deer. Like when you see a deer, it's called that, that free energy. Their ability to put force into the ground maximally but effortlessly. Mm-hmm. That's being fascially driven. Mm. If you're contractile, if you're muscular based, it's like you're using all these resources, all those contractile properties to like get from point A to point B. So it's like you're a diesel truck. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So don't get me wrong. Both are cool, but one is a lot more efficient and effective than the other. Especially mm-hmm. at basketball. Absolutely. Right. Especially at a sport like basketball. Football, totally different story, right? Mm-hmm. Especially up front. But in basketball, oh man, especially the way it's played now. Absolutely. I mean, now you got six foot ten guards, right? You got yeah. six foot ten dudes who are not on the block anymore. They're shooting threes, right? It's all everybody's a guard now, mm-hmm. right? And and that's the way we're adapting as well. So, mass for mass sake isn't necessarily helping out the mm-hmm. basketball culture the way it's transitioning now. The days of Shaq's, the days of Dwight Howard's, those days are done. Yeah. You mm-hmm. know, for now, I mean, it might come back to it one day. I mean. It might be like fashion. It might be I don't something. know. The way we're seeing the NBA game evolve and the scoring and how high it is, I don't know if we could go back the other direction. I don't direction. know if you could. No, I don't I think don't we I don't know if you could unless there's some rule changes like the goal goes back to 12 foot or something. I don't, I don't, <laughs> yeah, it goes yeah. up to 12 foot, I should say. But like, I don't know. Like, That's a great question. Now, do you do you, uh, do you you watch a lot of basketball or are you in it so much that you don't have the time for Man, it? Okay, so glad you asked that. So I play college basketball. It wasn't necessarily the best experience. Like, I, I It wasn't the best team experience I've ever had. Right? Mm-hmm. Like... It, you know, I play low-level basketball. You shouldn't expect much anyways. But when you see a good program and a good head coach and a good atmosphere and a good – then you're like, oh, my God, like, whoa, like, this yeah. is way better. So at first it was almost like this, like, bitter – bitterness to basketball. So I was like, fuck it. Like, you know, I know a lot about it. Sweet. But, like, at that time and early in my career, I was like, I want to go into special forces. Like, I want to go – I want to go train those guys because those are – you know, they're, they're doing some real shit. Like, you know what I'm saying? And then, like – Basketball just kept being in the back of my head, like Corey. Those are your guys. Like that's the that's the language. That's you love that culture. Even like, go back to it. And so from that, from ever since I was uh, the director at Santa Clara, just down the street, actually. Um, from that point, I just I, I watch NBA all the time. I yeah. watch college all the time, and. You know, my wife gets super pissed off at me because she's like, don't you see this every day? And I'm like, you're 100% right. But I'm watching, I'm not even watching basketball. I'm watching movement. Yeah. I'm watching the best dudes move and why they move a certain way. I'm just like, oh, man. Let's start training the outliers, not training the general. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Like it, let's look at the outliers. Don't look at them as, oh, they're freaks. Look at them as, oh, no, maybe we can train to that because mm-hmm. mm-hmm. I think that's a big problem or a misconception in, in how we train is, yeah, let's get generally strong. Let's get this. Let's get that. Well, I think you're talking about it uh, on your, on the last podcast where, you know, Valgus is actually not a bad thing, guys. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, like you see that internal rotation. Like when you see guys take off, like truly take off off one foot or two or that uh, one, two gathering, their left foot or their lead foot is internally rotated. It's like horizontal to the goal. When they take off. When Paul talked about that, that was like blew my mind. Because I am this guy who can drop step dunk and running off of one foot, I get the same height. So like it was just... Oh, yeah. Because my mechanics aren't there. And when I look at some of these NBA players, they are. They're wound completely. Mm -hmm. And it, and when you watch it in slow motion, you go like, is that is that right? Should it be that way? But it makes right. so much sense when he breaks down the mechanics. Best shooters I've ever seen. Valgus like you wouldn't believe. Yeah. Yeah. Best shooters I've ever seen. 
Mm. But, like, and it just, watch Kevin Durant. And yeah. he does that corkscrew effect. Yeah. And you're just like, yep, he just got really, really good at it. Now, the problem is, how would you teach that to someone that doesn't do that? Because oh, that might don't. not be, yeah, I was yeah. just going to yeah, say. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah, that, that's special, right? Mm -hmm. That's special, that's repetition, that's genetics, that's a lot of things. I don't know if you can necessarily teach, because to me, that that's more on the skill like sports specific skill. Mm -hmm. So in my role as a strength coach, like it's more of, you know, obviously just training athleticism mm -hmm. and then hopefully that enhances their already ability, right? To mm -hmm. go over to skill. Now, something I'm very interested in is going into that skill development route. But mm -hmm. in college sports, I can't even have a basketball in my hand. It's a violation. Like, oh really? shit. Not even kidding. Oh, I didn't know that. I can't even pass a ball to a kid. What? Not even kidding. Oh, that's hilarious. That's well, the weird. reason for that, and it makes a lot of sense because at what first I'm like this. Ball? Oh, yeah, med ball, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> not a basketball. Like a basketball. Not a basketball. <laughs> just hack the system. Right, just, yeah. hack the si just throw a girl's ball out. Maybe that, yeah. I, maybe that could work. Um, but the reality is what sport, like a lot of sport coaches uh, won't value strength as much as, much as others. So mm -hmm. what would they do with that strength coach position? Oh, I'm just going to hire another assistant. Oh, I see. Right, oh, and wow. so, now, so now you just got an extra coach opposed to someone to help a kid, you know, be resilient, be durable, performance oh, enhancement, hopefully, you know, X, Y, Z. So, you know, it makes a lot of sense. Now, from a guy who hooped, like, it's just like, oh, my God, it's rolling to me. <laughs> yeah. It's right there. Like, yeah. just, ah, but, you know, just, just don't do it. What's one of the – what are some of the biggest mistakes you see with, with strength coaches now when they're training – well, let's do this. When they're training kids, uh, younger kids, high school, and when they get up to your level and higher. Load. Just too much? percent load, yeah. Too much load. I mean, it's – look, they – I always get the – I, I, I get in a lot of conversations with these quote unquote performance coaches at the high school level that, you know, they're in, in they're with my guy because they're coming to Stanford and, you know, they want to connect with me and they oh, want to, like, hey, you know, these, this is what I've been doing with them. And 99.9% <laughs> .9 of the conversation, I'm like, stop doing that. Like push ups, dips, pull ups, step ups, body weight squats, side lunges, skipping rope. Do that. Mm. None, but I got to get him ready for, I will get him ready. Like don't break him before he gets here. Uh -huh. Right. And so then that, you know, I got, they got to oh, love yeah. you for that one. Oh, for sure. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> but then I get like, oh yeah, but he can clean though. A word. Like, let me see this shit. Right? You know, like, uh, I'll be the judge of that. <laughs> yeah. right? And so that's where I'm like, Hey man, you know what? It's not important. And that's where, I don't know. Maybe, maybe that's like in the subconsciously in the back of my head where I went with this regressed approach throughout mm -hmm. the past like three years is the more, and that's why I'm like so active on social media with my Instagram is I'm putting out so much like regression exercises. Cause I'm like, yo do that with the younger kids. Mm -hmm. Like, because I don't want you bringing those fucked up kids to me anymore. You know, like, <laughs> right. cause they come in broke, man, broke. And then on top of that, on top, uh, on top of bad technique and compensatory patterns and all this, you're just, that's why I mean, when I come in, they don't come in at zero. They come in at like negative two, negative yeah. three. Can you speak upon, um, in terms of like specialization? Cause I know that became very popular amongst, you know, parents even, and they've been preached like you need to get your kid into that one sport and have them go year round and, you know, get really good at that. And, uh, in terms of like the ideal situation of, uh, how you would prefer like a young athlete, uh, you know, to go through that process. So if I can make like a, is it a PTA announcement or a PSA announcement? Yes, the exactly. Yeah, we'll put you on a soapbox PSA. right now. Yeah. All right. Stop doing that shit. Like just don't put your kids into one sport at an early age. It's not making them better. They're not going to earn that scholarship anymore. I, I'm, go I'm telling you right now, if you haven't been identified by the eighth grade, you're probably not going to get that division one scholarship <laughs> period. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. And it's not that you're identified from a skill set standpoint, right? Like you're identified based off, man, that dude's got really long arms. That dude's got like the anthro or the, the body type mm. to be able, and he's well coordinated and he's able to, you know, shoot the ball a little bit, you know, like we can get him better at that. Mm -hmm. like, and then, you know, he'll evolve when he's playing in more specialized like AAU circuits and stuff like that. So they're looking at things that you can't coach at an early age. So I'm sorry, but if you're five foot white dude who has no bounce, stop mm -hmm. it. Like, I'm not saying stop your dream, like train as hard as you can, like do whatever you think you, you got to do to make it to the next level. But it just sticking yourself into that one sport is going to wreck you before it makes you better. An interesting study done at the Olympic Training Center when I was there, they asked all the residential athletes how many sports they played in high school. The average was four or five. Wow. Mm -hmm. Which I'm sitting there like, these are the most specialized athletes on the planet. Yeah, the, the most specialized. Right. So you're telling me your kid 
playing basketball year round, like that's going to get them there. No, make them really good athletes. Give them a huge reserve or a huge toolbox to be successful within their sport. Right. And I mean, look, great examples, Steve Nash, Kobe Bryant, great soccer players, Mm -hmm. really, really good soccer players. A lot of dudes are good football players, Mm -hmm. you know? Um, And that's where I'm just like, Hey guys, like the early specialization, I get it. Trust me. But, and that's another thing too. Like that's, I think it's crazy with parents is, they think everyone's going to get a Division One scholarship, and then you know they're not going to have to pay for college for their kids. You know? <laughs> I think it's all these like selfish reasons, to be honest with you. But yeah, you know, like just let the kids play, let them go into directions, and, and from that perspective, I think you're going to have a better end product if that's the goal. Mm-hmm. Right? There's also just the 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 risk of injury. I mean, when you're doing the same sport and that's all you do all the time, it's the same movements over and over and over again. So your increase of Increasing risk of muscle imbalances or incre- increasing risk of overuse injuries. I mean, if you're always throwing a baseball, or you're always pitching mm-hmm. a baseball. Yeah, there's only so many your, reps. You know, your elbow and your shoulder, right, are going to get all this wear and tear throughout all these formidable years versus when you put a kid in, in multiple sports. Now there's different movement patterns. There's right. their bodies moving. And so they don't develop the risk of, of developing injuries or imbalances is much, much lower. I trained. I remember I had this one, this high school baseball athlete who all he ever did was play baseball and he had a wicked fastball. But when I would train him, the difference between his right and left side was so pronounced, it was almost as if his spine had twisted a little bit to mm-hmm. compensate because he had done it since he was such a young kid. That could, and that was a problem. That became a big problem for him as he got into college. Like all I did is when I trained him was try to get his other side to catch up so he didn't hurt himself. That might not have happened had he played lots of different sports. I think that's the biggest selling point that when I tell parents, it's like, look, you're gonna your kid's gonna get hurt. They keep playing the same sport and that's all they play. They're doing the same movements all the time. You're just asking for trouble. And then forget, you know, getting into a division one college if they hurt. Well, like I was saying earlier, when when I first get my kid in, I mean, we're in the we're in a wrestling room. We're not in the weight room. Mm-hmm. We're not in on the basketball court. Like we're in a wrestling room. Why? Because that's the best human capacity like that be, being able to push and pull being able to crawl being able to floor to standing transitions because i have to go that far down the line of childhood development because they've lost it mm-hmm. they lost it because of early specialization and and to me like if i if i didn't have to do that man i could do some really cool shit like mm-hmm. i can i mean 100% i could yeah, you want seven inch verticals? Great. Let's do all that. But that's not my job. Like in a current strength and conditioning role, that's not your job. Your job is to make them as durable and resilient to stress and injury as possible. Mm. Performance, that's out, it's out the window. Like it's further down the line because now you're just, they didn't, they didn't come there to jump higher. They came there to play basketball, mm. right? Mm. And you know who's to say there's a direct correlation to better basketball with higher verticals? You know, I don't know if there is there one. I don't. I don't know if that 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 exists. Mm-hmm. Now, being able to be more athletic, maybe. Mm-hmm. But what I've seen is my most athletic dudes coming in raw. They're probably the worst shooters I've had too, because mm-hmm. they can't control that kind of power that they're creating. Mm-hmm. So you know, there's a there's so many factor or layers to it, mm-hmm. um, and that's what's so fun about the job. Oh, yeah. like, it's always evolving. You're never going to f- truly figure it out. You're going to find a lot of things that are common, and then you just drift towards those. But y- you're going to have those outliers and you're going to learn so much more about you know being a coach. Now, for young guys and girls that are aspiring to be coaches like yourself, what are some of your favorite uh, education tools or certifications? I saw you posted on uh, FRC not that long ago, which we, we talk a lot about. Um, I think Justin's told me, too, that you're even into animal flow. What are some of the best uh, certifications or pieces of education for coaches to research? Well, uh, FRC was very important because... FRC came at a time where I was kind of like over certifications. Yeah. So I was like, yeah, certifications I'm done with. Yeah. I, I just need to go see brilliant people <laughs> and learn you. from them. Uh, but when FRC came through, I was like, oh, this is something that actually gets me excited. But it also makes sense. It's based off of, what, 50 years of isometric research? Mm-hmm. It's just applied a different way. Brilliant. Wait, great job, Andrew Espina, you know, or Dr. Andrew Espina, I should say. Um, but... My best resources, like with all the tumbling, the level gymnastics, the jujitsu. I mean, the tumbling stuff. There was a cheerleader that I was hooking up with at the time. Yeah, <laughs> like you know, story. like, like it's low story. level gymnastics. Like you know how to tumble, you know how to roll. Like so, I was like, "Can you show me?" 
Yeah. <laughs> okay, I'm going to do this with you my got some good moves. Like, yeah. Hey, you know? yeah. I need to be able to see your moves. biomechanics. Would yeah. you mind taking <laughs> off? <laughs> so yeah, it worked out really well. Um, and then I never thought I'd say this. Like, if, if the listeners can understand real quick, athletic trainers and strength coaches, there's generally a budding of heads. Yeah, it shouldn't be that way, but there's like this weird... Like, uh, like I know better for them. It's like a weird rivalry. Yeah, yeah. it's a weird rivalry. But, you know, I, fortunately in my career, I've never had to experience that. Like I've had great athletic trainers and we, I mean, it's all about collaboration. Like if you're really trying to get, if it's really for the athlete, you have great collaboration. Um, but I hear horror stories all the time, you know, about like, it's just always conflicting, telling one athlete one thing and undermining each other. But anyways, um, there's this, the director of sports medicine at, at Stanford. His name's Aton Gelber. I never thought I'd say this about an athletic trainer, but he's probably the most badass motherfucker I've ever met in my life. Mm-hmm. I mean, this dude, um, jujitsu guy, uh, Israeli special forces, like he was just a badass motherfucker back in his day. And I heard about him coming out here. And so I immediately gravitate to him. Like, hey, I, I just want to learn from you. Like he, this guy's got sub disciplines and everything under the sun, like li- like internationally renowned. And so he takes me into the wrestling room. Obviously, beats the shit out of me, but I learned so much from the just the partner training aspect that just opened up my mind. So as far as like the learning, don't get me wrong, go get your certifications. Like, but just because you have a lot of alphabets behind your name does not make you a better strength coach. Period. Like mm-hmm. I, I can't emphasize that enough. But seeking out brilliant people developing great relationships with them apprenticeships man uh, that's, well, that's gotta be one of the best things you man, could possibly do if i didn't have a mentor like i wouldn't be where i'm at today yeah. you know like so i mean I, I, any type of uh public anything that i do it, i always give credit to jonas serration i mean if it wasn't for that man i wouldn't be where i'm at today you know uh, but if getting into the field get a mentor asap get your certifications that you need to be successful in the field okay and then after that, seek out brilliant people and just go to them. Like, yes, you can go to conferences, but it's an hour block. Like, you're not going to learn that much, you know. But go go spend a weekend with them. Go spend a week with them. You know, do just totally engulf yourself into the world, and then you truly understand, you know, what what they're what you're trying to get out of that experience. Yeah, I feel yeah. like offering mm-hmm. free work. You're like, hey, I'll do anything, yep. work for you, whatever. Just let me follow you around and watch you. I feel like you'll learn so much more doing that than if you, what you could learn through any book. Absolutely. And this field right now is so oversaturated, like, especially in the strength market. Really? Oh, um, I have, I have 32 year old men doing free internships. Oh, wow. Hmm. Like it's so it's tough to job. crack in. I mean, it's unreal, but mm-hmm. that's the only way to get in. Mm-hmm. You know, you gotta, you gotta do your internships. You gotta do your voluntary work. You got, which a hundred percent, it should be the way, but this field is so oversaturated. I mean, you got grown ass men coming in got family and kids and they're trying to make it and it's oh shit man this feel i I came in right as the bubble was bursting like i literally couldn't have timed it any better Mm -hmm. but and i was fast-tracked because i was a lucky son of a bitch number one but number two i just knew the right people at the right time it's a tough field because or area of uh of i guess strength because a lot of people want to be able to do what you're doing you get to work with top level athletes you get to work in a prestigious university um, it sounds like a lot of fun. And so what we communicate all the time on the show is, you know, aspire for that. That's great. But there are other aspects of the fitness space that you can enter into. For example, you know, correctional exercise of the, of, of you know, people in advanced age. That's not a saturated market and that's a growing right. and exploding market. And that's also one that you could succeed in. But your space is fun. It's fun. <laughs> yeah. But I think, I think we're the most, um, the most effect or the the best place to infiltrate so that we don't have these problems anymore that especially in college young kids i yeah. wish i had guys yes. in the in middle school and high school yeah. yeah there there needs to be an exploding market in that space i, I agree with mm-hmm. that we were just mm-hmm. talking before you got here about i yeah, think we're, i think we're going to see a major backlash i think just this whole new introduction of you know, iPhones and iPads and sitting down mm. and like staring at computer screens right. or video games. All, I mean, all of us were too, we weren't born with that. Sure, I, there was Atari and shit when I was a kid, but you still were outside playing 90% of the what time. What happened to monkey bars? Right. Yeah. Right. Exactly. right. Too dangerous. Right. Dude, just I'm to, telling you, we had these pull-up bars in our wrestling room and I just like, all right guys, we're just going to swing from left side to right side. 
what How do you uh, the do fuck that? is that yeah. <laughs> like, what do you mean like well this is what kids used to do right like yeah. so for shoulder health and integrity and this is why we're doing it okay mm -hmm. can't even make it grip wow. strength sucks yeah. right can't even can't even uh maintain that overhead position because why would they even be there right like it just it makes a lot god of sense. it makes me wonder yeah. what a different Bro, what we're going to see a you're it's gonna gonna be see so a, different you're going to see a major backlash in the next t decade. I truly believe this because we're just now you're just now getting them. You know what I'm saying? Like right. you you now are dealing with these 17 to 20 year old kind of age group which are, you know, for the most part most of them have dealt with Facebook and Instagram and the phones in their hands all yeah, day long. Yeah, but 5 long. to 10 years from now it's going to be so much worse. Oh, it's going to be Fact. yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. I mean, it's like we hmm. I, I would like to see it go back to the pen and paper age, mm -hmm. you know, where kids actually had to learn how to write and read. And, you know, I mean, I'm not with a screen, mm -hmm. you know, like evidently there's a new way to do math. Like what the fuck happened? Like I I had no idea there's a oh, new yeah, way to do is. division and subtraction. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I know. I was like, what is that? Like, I have no idea what that is. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Like, what do you there's a new it. way. Yeah. Oh, it's oh, totally shit. different. My third grade daughter will bring me homework and she's like, that's not how you do it. I'm like, yeah, but I'm getting the answer. Right. Yeah, I don't yeah, understand, right, but it's a whole right. no, different. We have to prove what? it all the way through. Right. Core, what? what do they call it? Core, core yeah, core math. Or, uh, yeah, I'm yeah, oblivious yeah. to it. Dude, there's oh, a new bro. way to do math, evidently, and I had no clue. But I had no yeah, idea. Welcome to the party. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Apparently, if you learn this way, then later on, it's easier for you to do math in your head and all that stuff, and they have studies to, to, to prove it. But as a parent, when your third and fourth and fifth grader brings you your homework, you must unlearn what you And you're like, learned. I don't even know what the fuck to do. <laughs> yeah. I can't help you. <laughs> yeah. Thank God we got Google. I know. Google that right, shit, you know? Right, right, right. So, no, it's hilarious. Yeah, could you imagine actually telling a kid to go to the library, find the book, yeah, do the research on the book, yeah, then put the book back. <laughs> do your decimal system. I don't think they could do that shit. Yeah, like, yeah, I yeah. honestly don't think yeah. that could happen. No, I think what we're going to, what we're going to see is what we saw similar with adults where gyms exploded and became popular uh, and people had to start scheduling workout time because everyday life was no longer a workout or active right. for adults. Now, children didn't follow this path for a long time. Kids always played outside until recently. Now, kids day-to-day -day life involves almost no activity in fact when i punish my kids i make them go outside it's totally opposite from when i was a amazing kid amazing dad when when i got punished yeah. i had to be inside right right, right. so it's, very, it's just the way it is now and so what i think you're going to see is an explosion of organized exercise for children the same way we've seen it with adults where you have to actually schedule it right. and make it it just doesn't happen naturally, naturally like it used to i mean go yeah. outside walk around outside see how many kids you see playing outside it just doesn't look the way it used to so it's gonna be fascinating to, to talk to you like five years from now right and what kind of problems you're gonna see with the kids you well know, it explains in. why he's already having to do that with coaches where it's like no stop doing all that just jump some fucking rope do some pull-ups right. do some you know basic body weight movements because of that because i'm sure that's they're already broken like you said, they're you're minus three when they're coming into you. And so. there's a little bit of a self selection bias because you're getting athletes, right? Fact, <laughs> yeah. fact. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah, and that's what's it, it's got to come from the top though. Yeah. I mean, it's got to come from Western society. Like it's got to say, hey, you know, in kindergarten they can play, all the way to the fifth grade they can play. Like let's get them outside and involved in anything. But because of, you know, no child left behind, the Bush era, mm -hmm. all of a sudden now everyone is average, right? Smart mm -hmm. kids coming down, dumb kids coming up a little bit. And now there's no arts, there's no science, or there's no more sciences, there's no uh, physical education. Great. Now all that shit's optional. Like, think about, I, I forgot what school in California, it was the 60s, I want to say, maybe it's a De La Salle or something like that. But their major mission was physical competency or physical education and they had within two years they had the highest uh highest test scores in the state and the most kids to go to college mm. and i'm sitting there like what happened guys yeah. like they they had, they already did it for us they already rolled out the model right like man you wonder where adhd and all that comes from right doesn't come from sitting yeah yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> hey, let's, like you know what i'm saying like oh man those little bastard kids they yeah. can't sit still for six hours during a day fuck Neither i can't can I. either yeah, yeah. yeah. Right? Like, i could never do that and then you feed them fucking corn dogs which that's a whole nother story like yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yeah that's like, i think it's gotta it's gotta come from the top yeah it's and people forget that movement is facilitated by the brain Yes. So when you move your body, you're developing neurons and neural connections in the brain, and it helps facilitate other types of learning. Same thing with music, lights up the whole brain. Yep. So it's not a, like, here's the intellectual stuff, and here's the physical stuff that is dumb. 
it's, no, it's all, all integrated. Right. Yeah, Here's your jocks. Here's your, right, your intellects. Yeah, no, no, it all goes together. Guys. Yeah, yeah. No, I think I agree with Adam. We're going to start to see a, a little bit of a pendulum swing in the opposite direction. It's just happened so fast. That's all. It's just happened so fast. We didn't know what the consequences were. We're going to start seeing some of those consequences. Hey, but is, the question is, who's going to capitalize on it? Uh, right. mm. Well, we'll see. Hey, kids, gyms. Ready, guys? Business. Done. Yeah. <laughs> we're all partnering up. Here right. we go. Right. Mind right. pump for My kids. Wheels are <laughs> My wheels are people coming. My wheels are coming. People have been asking for that for a long time, actually. Yeah, you know, we get yeah. a lot of people that want mind pump for well, the that's kids. That's one of my biggest goals is getting involved with Team USA in some form or fashion. Because, mm -hmm. you know, you had these youth, yeah, U12, U15, right. U18, you know, whatever. Well, do they have any physical competency tests? Like, do they have any check boxes to say along the way? Like, at U13, you should be able to do this. X, Y, and Z. Yeah. Right? So, like, what happened to that? You know, you see it in other programs across the world, but you don't see it here in the States mm -hmm. with yeah. one of our, you know, one of our best sports. Do they even still do the presidential physical That's fitness? a great question. I sucked at it. But, yeah, that's a good question. Yeah. Yes. I don't think so. Or, or at least it's not required. Well, you two have kids. You would know. Oh, I haven't well, seen. they're not old enough yet. No, no, no I was I, doing that no, early. I was, yeah. I, I, I was like, doing like, that in like first eight? grade. Yeah, yeah. I was doing really? that in elementary through middle. Yeah, we were the, doing pull-ups. The last time yeah. I did it was my freshman year in high school. Yeah. I think they either eliminated it or. I did it like third, sixth through six. Yeah. No, I haven't seen it. I haven't seen it Arnold back. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Back in the White House, bring the Terminator. The, yeah. well, so, because because you're with these, uh, you, you know, super athletes or on their way to be super athletes, what do you see like in professional sports? How basketball is evolving? What do you what do you see? What, what do you? I mean, it's, it's so cool to hear you doing the GPS thing because it's so funny. I just heard them talking about that with the Warriors, and I was like, oh shit, I didn't know they were doing that, and I didn't realize how few a teams are. I mean, I'm assuming that's one of the things. Like, what else do you see? as far as the, the professional sports evolving in your arena? You know, things that I want and that might not be there yet, but I see it in like high-end athletes is I think we should make blood testing mandatory. Oh. Mm. Um, For I think, what? So just looking at basic biomarkers, right? Mm. And then having really brilliant people interpret them. And, and I'm not saying there's nothing wrong with your general physician, mm -hmm. but the, un, their understandings of the biomarkers and how they affect one another is ugly yeah right? like they know they, disease exactly yeah. especially in correlation to an athlete right? Yeah, right you're looking for performance so like if you guys want a great resource look at dr james laval he wrote this book called the metabolic code hmm. probably one of the like i actually hired him to do my own blood work because, really oh yeah and is he based out of here is he close by no he's not close by so you actually go and get your blood done somewhere local okay. and then sent to him mm -hmm. he does the interpretation he yeah, writes me interview. he wrote me up like a 28 mm -hmm. page like a really? blood marker or like based off his interpretations of it. Not like, not, not norms, not none of this, mm -hmm. not, Hey, Corey's this, you know, high end athlete, if you will. <laughs> uh, but he's trying to do, yeah, there it is. Um, but yeah, he's, I mean, he's absolutely brilliant. Now what, what kind of markers are you looking at? Just general nutrient values? So and, like micronutrient deficiencies is okay. a huge one. And then obviously yeah, people don't realize how big that is because huge. You, you can take supplements all day long, but if you're lacking a micronutrient and you supplement with it, it's night and day. It's like right. you're a completely different human. Well, so you're that's just guessing. You yeah. know, there's a lot of guesswork into it, so mm -hmm. you just got a lot of expensive piss, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, and so that's where you got to like look at hormonal panels. Like mm -hmm. For instance, like certain guys that you think wouldn't have low test have low test. And you're mm -hmm. just sitting there like, damn, how does he have low test, right? But maybe his adrenals are screwed up, mm -hmm. so now he's suppressing all that. So mm -hmm. you know that's where like, okay – that's because of training and you can see how this should go into basketball or sports where mm -hmm. you're doing it maybe four to five times a year and you're just checking and seeing how the effects of training because no one just goes oh i got cancer mm -hmm. you know that is evolved over time that's because right. your your blood's been shit mm -hmm. for all these years yeah see know? we have uh, and this is just for the for the layman a little easier maybe less expensive way of doing it is we 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 work with the sponsor everly well that makes these at home Kids. Hormone yeah. tests and kits, right? And yeah. they're really inexpensive. And one thing that I've recommended to people, uh, to our audience is test yourself several times a year so you could see how your diet and your training affects your hormones. And then you start to figure out what your baseline. Oh, my testosterone goes up when I do this or it goes down when I do this mm -hmm. or look at my estrogen to progesterone level type of deal. I think what you're saying is absolutely right. Then they can test themselves and, and, and monitor. That would be absolutely brilliant. I mean, for me, that's like, okay, you wonder where like all these moods come from, right? Guys that are like always sick. Like mm -hmm. it ain't because, oh man, they just, the weather changes. Like, no man, it's because they're not putting the right stuff into their system. Now, 
information is power. Give mm-hmm. them that information. Then you can put them down the right path and actually supply them the right materials so they can be a more resilient human being. I could do all the training in the world with them. But if your blood shit, your blood shit. Like right. I can't help you. I mm. can't help you. Pass how did that. you? Did you, what did you see about your? If you don't mind me asking, yeah. what did you see about yours? And then how did you change your diet? Oh, low and testosterone and super low in ferritin. Um, oh wow. So yeah, like uh, low testosterone because he's asking like, how do you train? I'm like, well, I train like a douchey bodybuilder. So like, <laughs> I, like five to six times a week, <laughs> and I just rip. Like I'm like, uh, chest and back go. You know, like, I'm, like, I'm like that guy. And then of course I'm always tinkering on myself. So I'm like. Yeah, let's try like, you know, a 500 pound eccentric back squat today. Just do it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah like, yeah. Just, okay. You know, so I'm always wrecking myself. And so my, once again, that, that was the example I used earlier. Like my adrenals were just. Wow. So. And your, yeah. and your, and your iron levels were low. Did you yeah. take, did you have to, so you started supplementing with iron or so, changed your no, diet? Um, so, well, uh, also around that time I was like, yeah, the carnivore diet, duh, do that. <laughs> like just eat red meat. Yeah. And yeah. that's when he's like, yo, Corey, chill. <laughs> like, I like where you're going with this, but. You know, that's for like people who aren't doing shit, right? Mm -hmm. Like you are training at a different level, like carbs, like get that into your system. I was Mm -hmm. like, oh, okay. Um, And then he sends me like a slew of supplements, but you know, like it's, I was actually a good blood panel. Now I have another uh, individual that I know very well who got a bad, like his results were like, oh, you got tumors growing in your system probably. Oh, wow. Like you got some real shit. And this gentleman's 31 years old. Wow. And I was sitting there like, it's a 31 year old active male. Mm. And it's like very active male and very no brilliant idea. male. And I'm sitting there like, oh shit, like, dude, you could have not been with us by 50. Poor diet? What was it? Uh, is lifestyle. Yeah. Lifestyle was one, like, but it's work environment, super stressed all the time, mm. you know, working his ass off. He's, he's also doing, um, like, I think he's getting his doctorate as well. So, I mean, like dudes burn the candle on both ends. Mm hmm. And, um, yeah, so that's where you're like, geez, man. Like, Did you see your testosterone levels change as you like, oh, reduce the intensity? And so really, I just life? took a few days out. I was like, dude, just like, wow. Go. Well, he's like, Corey, hey, do you do any cardio whatsoever? I'm like, what the fuck is that? Like cardio? <laughs> like, no, man. It's, yeah. No. I just lift weights faster. Yeah, exactly. He's like, dude, like, let's do more reps, right? He's like, no, dude, like go for a walk. He's like, just do some, just go for a walk. That's yeah. all I ask you to do. Like go for a walk. I'm like, okay, I can do that. And then, you know, and that's when I was like, oh, okay, you know what? I'm going to be super fit. So I started playing basketball again and now I'm fucked. So thanks, Dr. J. <laughs> <laughs> now, now I'm sitting up. So uh, my next, uh, my next uh, consultation better be free. <laughs> but now he's a. Uh, um, no, he's going to be asshole. I told you to walk, not play right? basketball. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fact, <laughs> fact, yeah. 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 So you see, you see blood testing being something in the future that they I think can really 100%. benefit from. I think it's going to be much agree. more accepted. Uh, there's a great company called Inside Tracker, does the same thing. It's all web based. So they'll, you go to a, like a local site, they take your blood, and they post all your results on, on a web. Um, and all their stuff mm-hmm. is based off of sports nutrition research, period. Awesome. Like it ain't norms. It ain't none of that. It's all sport related. Mm-hmm. And so their recommendations are based off all those meta analysis, mm-hmm. not just like one or two studies or anything mm-hmm. like that. I mean like thousands and thousands of research articles. Fascinating. Um, and that's where it's like, okay, you should eat more of this, stop eating more of that. And then you see your blood panel changes. And we did that with a particular athlete last year and we saw like low magnesium. Well, he's a very contractile athlete. He needs magnesium. Mm-hmm. Why does he have that like low magnesium? Well, he eats like a cheerleader. Wow. Like we need to get him a, just food, right? Yeah. And obviously the right kinds of food. So then he was able to rebound from that and be just fine. It's like, what if we didn't have that? Yeah. And you know, what so. a difference, you know, and it sucks because if you don't know that, you just generally feel like something's off right? or just general fatigue. And that's where like, look, I, I know it's important, but I go outside and hire brilliant people to tell me what's what right Mm -hmm. and i learned from them but i'm by all means not like a blood expert Mm -hmm. so with anything that i do like look i'm an expert with picking up stuff putting stuff down with my athlete population right great but and that's one thing i think everybody's trying to be this savant with all of human performance and it's like yes you need to understand everything but if you want to do it the highest level consult Mm -hmm. like don't be afraid to pay some money like find the best in the world of what they do. And that's the, my overlying philosophy, not only in life, but like, especially in, in my practice is find the best in the world of what they do and find a practical way to apply it to my population. Excellent. So hundred meter sprinters, they're probably the fastest people in the world, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. Blood, blood experts, Dr. Vlau, probably best in the world. Okay. I'm going to listen to those guys and I'm going to learn from them and I'm going to find a way to do it with yeah. my 
giraffes with clown shoes. I would have to say, <laughs> I would have to say the best combination for a, an amazing coach would be being able to find metrics and read them, or have people who can read them that are objective and have a level of intuition that allows you to apply right. those things. That's the that's the, the the best combination I can think of. But the objective metrics are so important. We we did it recently with again with our our hormone test from Everly Well and found that you know my testosterone levels will. They, they looked normal, but I know I didn't feel like I normally do. So I changed a few things. All of a sudden, I started feeling like myself, got it tested. Oh, it's way up here. That must be my right. where I'm supposed to be at. Um, but that intuitive aspect of it, of being a coach, that's something that's hard to hard to learn. I think that's more from... You got to learn through a lot of failures. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like I you mean, can look at your athletes and get an idea of where to look. Right. Is the for point. Sure. Yeah. For sure. And, and I think that's one thing as a strength coach. Like, And now I'm, fi- I'm finally case in point where... If you don't have battle scars, like you, you don't know what limits are. You know what I mean? And I'm not saying I'm like because I'm banged up right now because I stepped on someone's foot. Like I now have battle scars, but like you got to put yourself in the hole hard yeah. to understand what even in the hole feels right. like, right? Mm-hmm. So, and I'm not saying you got to wreck yourself. Like don't don't be stupid, right? Like don't do jerks over your head with 120 max and then try to land it on your neck. Like I'm not saying crazy things, but. Like as a coach, you're constantly putting yourself to the test and experimenting on yourself just so you can know what's the most practical way to apply it safely to your athlete. It adds intuition. Yeah. It really and that does. gives you, yes, and exactly. That's what gives you that intuition because, man, I know what that feels like. I know what that looks like. Right. Exactly. It's an important to know their mental mm-hmm. space. I mean, I, I tell you what, I mean, I'm not an athlete and I tear my Achilles and I see what it did to me mentally. I can't imagine if I was playing a competitive sport, how much that would fuck with my head and like to get up every morning to do the little tedious things that I know I need to do to rehab this. Like I think it's important for you to know that, you know, let's talk a little bit about uh, the season, right? The season started. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. You know, what do you, what do you think about the team right now? How are you feeling about you guys' start? What do you think? Yeah, we're super young, yeah. um, but we're playing a very fun style of basketball. So it's very much like a Golden State Warriors, Houston Rockets, yeah. where you know we don't have we run small. I mean, we have a big lineup, but we run small mainly. Um, it's, so it's a lot of pick and pop threes. It's a lot of ball screen offense. So, and then um, on defense, I think it's more of an attack defense opposed to you know you're just preventing them from scoring. No, it's more of like a you're trying to. Um, Aggressive, uh, trap the yeah, ball, yeah, things like yeah, that. Yeah, so like you're almost put um, enforcing your will on them yeah. and getting them out of their sets more so than just, oh, okay, reacting to what mm-hmm. they do. Yeah. So you're more being the um, provocator, if you will. Mm. What do you think about the, the the four freshmen over at Duke right now? Have you seen them play? Have you watched much? I mean, it's a pro team. Too, <laughs> right? right? Wouldn't they be able to beat some of the pro I teams? Mean, it's, it's, I mean... No, but they're they're impressive. Good God, they're impressive. <laughs> um, very, very impressive group of young men. Um It'll be very interesting to see. Like it's almost like the the Fab Four, if you will. Like, yeah. It's I think it's the closest thing to that since then. Right. Right. You hmm. know. I mean, the, the Carolina teams back in like two thousand five, two thousand nine had a similar feeling. Right. Uh, but this is it. It's different. Yeah. <laughs> like it, it's different. No. What did they put? They put like thirty on on Kentucky the other night. It was just ridiculous. It was, I mean, stupid. We had one of our uh, athletes actually transfer to Kentucky. Uh, last year, and we were just sitting there like, I mean, no one could stop it. <laughs> like, I mean, it, Zion is a freak, man. Yeah. I mean, he's 280 pounds and moving like like, like, a, like a gazelle. 280? Dude. I mean, yes. Yeah, and so that's where I was like, it's like um, unhuman. Um, Patrick, right? Yeah. Um, we were talking or on his podcast like Fat Don't Fly, and I was sitting there like, yeah. that motherfucker does. <laughs> like, yeah, I mean, he, he ain't that lean, and he's. <laughs> flying but like <laughs> once again that's like the gravity he's oh, a yeah. freak bro. yeah like could you imagine if he was like below 10 yeah i mean pff, double yeah. between the legs you know like i mean well, that's probably what's gonna happen by the time he gets to the pros i'm sure someone sure. will tighten the diet up even more and he'll just improve like for sure god it's gonna be crazy to see now do you have uh favorite nba teams that you follow Man, you know, I'm, I'm more of a player guy. Okay. Like, I, like, I like favorite players. So, Who are some of your favorite players right now? Uh, well, Russell Westbrook by far. Oh, you like the worker, huh? Yes. Mm. You I, like, love, I love Westbrook. Nobody, nobody plays harder than that Dude, guy. No, I mean, the passion that he has and, of course, just the raw athleticism. I mean, the dude's a freak, yeah. man. Mm-hmm. And so it's it's fun to see guards play like that. You yeah. Know, like, I mean, he's a point guard, so it's fun to see point guards oh. that can – play above the rim like that. I was just having mm-hmm. this conversation with someone the other day that, you know, everybody, of course, we, we always compare to Jordan. Everybody compares everything to Jordan. And, 
you know, everyone talks about LeBron and him. I think that no one has played with the intensity that Jordan played during his era since Russell Westbrook. I think Russell Westbrook is the closest thing like to that. Yeah. that level of intensity mm-hmm. into the game. Maybe they're different players and they play differently uh, and obviously have had different success. But Westbrook brings this on, on, on a basic exhibition game. Every, it looks like it's right. a fucking playoff or a championship game every single I mean, game. It, like the best way to describe him is it's, it's violent. Yeah, like yeah. you know, his yeah. movements are violent. Yeah, and that's what I, I, I that's mm-hmm. the, like one of my cues that I use with my athletes all the time. Like, move it violently. Like, be violent. Like, because that's 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 the if you want to be an athlete, like you just want to get better athletic qualities. Look at just, just look at Russell Westbrook. Yeah, like, yeah. that's the guy you want to be. Like, I mean, no, so it's obviously funny you that pick first step. He's it. like one of my least favorite players. <laughs> oh yeah, because <laughs> I'm yeah. so I'm the other, fashionista too. Well, I like that. I, yeah, well, I like yeah. I'm a I, I like to see I'm a team guy, and I think that's because I wasn't athletic because I relied on the screen, the pick and roll. <laughs> okay, Tim saying? Duncan, here. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> exactly. I love the Spurs. I love watching the Spurs yeah, play yeah. during the that that whole era. And John Wood. I absolutely love the Warriors because I love the, the the chemistry and yeah. seeing these guys come together and play like that. So well for me, like, I, like and it's a lot of my immaturity when I was young. But you know, I was super like flashy. Like I just cared. Like I ooze and ahs more than assist to turnover ratio. Yeah, you know yeah, what I'm yeah, saying? Yeah. Like I love the. I and mean, that's the reason why I started playing basketball because I thought that shit was so cool. Yeah. <laughs> and then you know, then Iverson. Right. Oh, and then I was yeah. like, oh sh- man, oh, Alan shit. Iverson, like that was my guy. He's Crazy, short, flashy, he doesn't play he above the rim. Like it. I can yeah. be that, you know. <laughs> so uh, I got excited about, it. and then Russell Westbrook comes along, and I'm sitting there like, oh my god, he's super Iverson. You know what I mean? Like he can yeah. just play above the rim. The like question that. is, you know, can he win? Is he going to win? Are they ever going to put some guys around him that they can all play together? I don't think it's going to be anytime soon. No, I, I don't think it's going to be this year. Like, Who I the think fuck's going to stop the Warriors, man? I think he's got to go. Like, I think maybe what Westbrook's got to go somewhere, maybe. I don't know, but I got a good friend who actually works on the staff. Oh, really? Um, and so he's he he's very, very, uh, very brilliant young man that just transitioned from, like, an intern role to, I mean, he's, like, guarding Westbrook in practice, like, during individual. Oh, no stuff. shit. And I'm like, dude, like, how you situate yourself into that is amazing. But you used to play one-on-one against each other all the time, and I'm <laughs> sitting there like, so, like, I kind of played Russell Westbrook one on one since I played you one on one. Like that's yeah, how yeah. I'm like justifying it to myself. <laughs> like since you did, I mean, you used to. So yeah, that works, right? No, but now are you are you a a talent acquisition guy or do you believe in like leadership in the organization? Like when mm. you look at in NBA or college? NBA. Okay, college talent. <laughs> yeah, uh, talent, hundred percent. Um, nah, you got you got you got to have for longevity. You got to have. Uh, you gotta have leaders. Like the talent is obviously what you need to win. Okay, good. We agree here. This but to is- win long term, yeah. right? Like yeah. you gotta have those leaders in place. And that's where like, like examples of my past, like some of like one of our UAB teams beat Carolina. Oh shit! Sure. But we we made fourth in conference that year, mm. right? So if you have the talent, but if you don't have the leadership, the maturity, the all the other things that go along to winning long term. It doesn't matter. No, I have a flash in the pan. No, I agree. In in college, in college, I see talent acquisition because in college, it is. I mean, you can go out, recruit five of the most athletic freaks in the in in the country at the time, and you have a huge advantage. You might not have to be a good coach, and you can still win. Exactly, but Mm -hmm. you get to the professional level. Everybody's a freak. Everybody's the most talented. You know what I'm saying? So at that point, I think leadership organization become it trumps that. absolutely right. and from what i understand the okc okc organization is one of the best oh really like, uh, from it's a young uh owner or a young gm uh very like he i think he likes to pride himself like kind of like a like an entrepreneur or like an innovator kind of like the silicon valley yeah like feel like i think that's how he uh, uh how should i say it's a, 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 uh, describes himself but you know, when you have guys like that, and like Philly too, like Philadelphia got Todd Wright, who's a 76 er string coach. Yeah. They're bringing in all these other She's human got performance Butler, guys. Man. What's up? Didn't they just pick up Butler? Didn't Butler yeah, just Yeah, go- Butler's now with Dude. Sixers, which that, that might be some legit stuff. But I look at that kind of the same as LeBron going to the Lakers. Like, he surrounded himself with young talent. Yeah. So... Mm-hmm. That could that could go bust real quick too. Yeah, but Butler's an animal. Like I like him. Yeah, I like no, him a lot. No, no, for sure. That's correct, dude. I, you know, I I definitely think that it's leadership, dude. For sure. Yeah. I think leadership at that at that level, because you're you're dealing so much with the the ego of all oh, the, of man. these guys. I can you, only imagine. You made it. You made it to the league. You you're made the it, man. Who like, the fuck's gonna tell me otherwise? Well, that and it's like 
well, my Under Armour deal is this. What? Yeah. Like, you know, like I'm making multi millions on you. Like <laughs> it doesn't like no. I'm so really more, like, what do you, what do you think about uh, you know college athletes uh, making money? Do you mm. think they? Ooh. Should, yeah, let's talk about that. Let's, Damn. Yeah, we man. have to go here. and also we college it. football. Bro, I let's have talk to. about playoffs yeah. and yeah, versus we bowl have games. To. This is okay. like one of the biggest things debated in college yeah. sports: is should we pay these athletes or oh. should we not? God, you guys are such assholes. Yeah, wow. So, um, I'm the hot but, seat. You're the guy I want to talk to yeah. about this stuff. Okay. Exactly. Um, e- yes. Short answer, yes. Okay. Long answer, if it pays me less, no. Uh, <laughs> 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 um, but, I mean, short answer, yes. Yes, I, I think so. Absolutely. But there's so many asterisks to that. So, for instance, how do you know how much to pay? Right. Does certain universities get more? Because of more of like, for instance, like a blue yeah, blood like program because they make cap. more money. Right. So right. now they the kid gets more exposure. So he gets paid for more time on TV and more jersey sales and more this. Right. So now what happens to recruiting? Mm. Now kids don't go to the universities that they want or mm-hmm. get the education that they're really looking. They're going to the place that they're going to make the most money. So it's not even college basketball anymore. It's not even amateurism. It's pros. Mm-hmm. Right. So how do you do that? Okay, well, now let's pay everybody evenly. Well, how does that work? Right. right. So I, I think there's a lot of holes in that too. Right. And it can't be that much. Yeah. You know, so that's where it's going to be an interesting way of figuring that out. What I really think should happen is the G League step up. Like the G League starts paying these guys to stay at home opposed to going overseas. Okay. Like the G League becomes a true minor league system or like a farm system. Right. Like just like you see in baseball. Baseball right. has right? it down, yeah. So that's where like, okay, if a kid chooses not to go to college, go into the G League because you've been identified because of your talent, go. Boom. Mm-hmm. Easy. Mm-hmm. Great. Mm-hmm. And then keep the amateurism in college. You yeah. know, but mm-hmm. then again, I'm coming from a situation where this is how I feed my family too. So right. Yeah. So like I'm like Shit, don't threaten that. Yeah. <laughs> now, as soon as you see enrollments drop and all that, they might just go straight to the, to the sure. minor leagues. Yeah. For sure. Now, as an as an outsider, I I don't I don't know, and so again, this is why I like talking to someone like you. But I I have to believe that it fucking happens anyways. Like it's still going mm. on. Yeah. Okay. So players being played, uh, paid. I will say this: a hundred percent, it's all going down. Like what's being investigated right now is not even not even the snowflake on top of the iceberg wow or the tip of the iceberg wow like it's getting but i'm so upset that it's only being seen in basketball football come on I know. you're telling me football <laughs> shouldn't be on this platform as well right. or on this stage Absolutely. come on you know those kids are getting broken off yeah like yep. so that's where i'm like i think it's a little unfair that they're pointing all this at basketball once again i'm a little biased because i'm in it but 100 percent, man like it's going around everywhere Right. Everywhere at every level. I mean, <laughs> I had friends uh, that were like playing D three ball, getting paid. Damn it, D three. Like D three. I'm like, yeah. that guy really needed his job. Well, this is why. Wow. So I had buddies at, at D two schools that you know, and they weren't getting paid big money, but you know, their apartment got taken care of. Uh, they yeah. never, they never paid for food anywhere. Like, mm-hmm. right. and so I'm like, if these cats are getting red carpet treatment at D two, you can't tell me that some big name D one kid right. isn't getting paid somehow. Now. How do they, how do they get around that? Now, my uh, what I would guess or what I would think is like these, um, what do you like alumni would, mm, mm. you know, get together like, for, you know, here I, I'm an alumni from from Duke, and so is my three other buddies, and we're all mm-hmm. multi millionaires, and so we adopt a kid and right. we kind of take care of them. I would think that would be the loophole to try and get around a lot of this shit. How, well, do you know how it gets down? So I, I mean, it's like the movie Blue Chips. Remember that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Back yeah. In the day? yeah so I, I think that's like, I think. It's all also self-preservation. So everything they have to do has to be like non-trackable. Right. So how do they figure that out? Like, and once again, I'm just a meathead in a weight room. Like my understandings of how this shit goes down. And that's the great, the one thing when all this went down, I slept so easy. Why all some, some of my other dudes in this field were like, oh shit, like we about to all get fired. Uh But I know I'm sleeping easy because Mm -hmm. I know my boss. And I know the integrity. And of course, we're at Stanford. Like, that doesn't go down there. Right. Mm-hmm. So I, that's one thing that I'm like, oh, man, thank God. Like, it's going to be interesting to see where you go next year. But yeah. like, I, I know for sure that we're good. But um, as far as like how they get it, I think, now, once again, I could be wrong. Yeah, we're speculating right we're now. We're speculating. But you're a fun person to speculate but with. From one, from one uh, story or a multitude of stories that are all saying the same thing, I should say, back when I was in the South. <laughs> 
was football players were getting paid through churches. Oh, shit. What? So they would make a, a gigantic donation to that kid's church. Oh, wow. And then... Shit. Yeah. So that's I, gangster. That is fuck. gangster. Like, that, oh, once again, that's, that's all a whole nother leather uh, level. Excuse me. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. that's like super. Spe- like once again, I don't know shit. I'm just the meathead in the weight room. But like these are some of the things that I've heard through the grapevine. Right. Because um, wow. they have to. They've got to find a. I mean, it's, I, you know, I think if, it, if they're private universities, they're already you're paying to go there. Private university to do what the fuck they want. They want to pay a student. Let them pay a student, and then watch what happens. Let the yeah. market take care of it and well, watch the competition. The problem with that, like Corey says, is then then how do you then how do you even the playing field? How do you make it same fair way to... you do in the pro leagues? I, mean, I don't think it. But then then now it's pro. That's okay. So it's yeah. just college. They're private organizations. Let them do what they want, and and then but what see about what the happens. state schools? Like I don't know how that works. Like Carolina's a state school. Kentucky's mm-hmm. a state that's school. That's different. That's controlled by the state. That's a whole. They right. they control. The, but I'm talking about the private university. They should be able to do whatever the hell they want. So it would be and, really interesting if you just have a private league. Yeah, like no, I mean, that's where you have to go to then. Yeah. Like, all of I think sudden- it's silly that they regulate the hell out of it. Let's see what happens. Let them pay them. I mean, it's already like 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 Adam says, and I agree. It's probably happening, you know, here and there, you know, behind closed doors anyway. Let them do what they're going to do. They compete for students the way they want to compete, and then see what happens. Well, a lot of this ain't even coming from alumni. It's coming from the shoe companies. Yeah, like let's yeah. not forget that. Like right. a lot of this is coming yeah. from that. That's right. So. Um, and that's what's being investigated. Right? It ain't like the booster, you know, yeah. who got rich with a chicken farm, you know, just because he got an alumni, like, you know, he's like, oh, yeah, yeah we'll give that kid $50,000. Like, no, it's really coming from these shoe companies. So, which, by the way, I love shoes. I, I love everything that I get at Stanford. So, <laughs> not trying to yeah, shit yeah, on yeah. anything right now. I'm not trying to shit on that. <laughs> no, no, no. Don't bring light to that. Yeah. 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 Good well, shit, well, man. Awesome, good deal, man. man. Yeah. 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 Thanks for coming on, bro. I know. Yeah. Absolutely, gentlemen. It was an absolute pleasure. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. We'll definitely do this again for awesome sure. Stuff. We yeah. wish you a speedy hey, recovery. I, and we want to go to a yeah. game. I'm just going to put yeah. it on yes, there. Absolutely. I'm going to put, absolutely. I'm gonna put you like on the spot. Tell, gun, tell me what game. Yeah. Tell me what game. Okay. I can pick. So the best game would be go. a conference. So like UCLA. Yes. Yes. Oregon would be a good one. I would love to. Yes. I would love to. He's special. Yeah. Seven foot three guard. What? Yeah, like he's special. Now, how do you get decent seats or what? Or do we have to sit I'm all? On the, I'm on, man. <laughs> oh, do you get these? <laughs> yeah, seats? yeah, yeah. Oh no, you'll, you'll get you'll get my seats. Oh, oh, oh yes. yeah. 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 All right. So, I like your yeah. style, Adam. Fuck yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah, he's getting to I got to put him on recorded now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're friends now. Now I can get right to the real boys. Okay, now I get your tickets. Good shit. Awesome. Thanks, man. Right on. Great job, Corey. Thank you for listening to Mind Pump. If your goal is to build and shape your body, dramatically improve your health and energy, and maximize your overall performance, check out our discounted RGB Super Bundle at mindpumpmedia.com. The RGB Super Bundle includes MAPS Anabolic, MAPS Performance, and MAPS Aesthetic. Nine months of phased expert exercise programming designed by Sal, Adam, and Justin to systematically transform the way your body looks, feels, and performs. With detailed workout blueprints and over 200 videos, the RGB Super Bundle is like having Sal, Adam, and Justin as your own personal trainers, but at a fraction of the price. The RGB Super Bundle has a full 30-day money-back guarantee, and you can get it now, plus other valuable free resources at mindpumpmedia.com. If you enjoy this show, please share the love by leaving us a five-star rating and review on iTunes and by introducing Mind Pump to your friends and family. We thank you for your support, and until next time, this is Mind Pump.